Good evening, everybody. This is the special meeting of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education on Monday, October 7th at 7 p.m. Uh, yeah. 616. And we are at Longfellow. Alyssa, will you please call roll? Member Doshi. Here. Member Hannah. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member Olchick. Here. Member Samanti. Here. Member Weiner. Here. Member Hughes. Here. All right, we've got a little bit of a tight time frame tonight, so we're going to go ahead and, and dive straight into an update um, from the health and wellness. Uh, kicking off is going to be Todd Drayfall. I'm, I'm sending, I'm going to talk, well, I sent him to you, so hopefully I get this done. Um, so this is an update um, on wellness and health, and to bring everyone up to speed, uh, although I think most of you may have the history, but just kind of level set everything. Um, last year, year ago, when we came in with negotiation, insurance was a big piece, um, and we negotiated all three contracts in the last uh, 14, 15 months. Uh, but obviously insurance and benefits and costs are a huge uh, piece of that. Uh, in the process of, of negotiating with the DGPA, um, a couple things came out of that. Uh, one was shift from a flat dollar amount to a percentage uh, for premiums. The other piece was the $200 copay for ER visits. Um, the other piece, which is a big piece, was the idea that we can offer alternative plans to the PPO. Um, and another uh, big piece was the committee structure, in that we took the old insurance committee format and turned it into uh, what we call the wellness, health and wellness committee, where all of um, the bargaining units have um, positions and so forth, so as to have uh, you know, everyone has some joint uh, ownership uh, and, and discussion and, and process. So it was a, a change and a shift um, <clears throat> where the committee would come and review and work for the year uh, and make recommendations to the board on changes, rates, so forth. Uh, understand the board still, you know, uh, held uh, its right to, you know, to set rates, um, but that, you know, the committee would, would work on that. So, all of that to say, you know, we've been working for the full year. We've had, I'll say, not the best year on a plan piece because we've had some expenses. Um, but we've also had a lot of work that we've done uh, with making adjustments and, and, and making and moving things in the right way in, the, in a different format. So with that, um, through all the conversations, uh, the board approved a rate increase for July 1st. Um, Understand we one of the things we wanted to do was shift our structure. Our rate increases were July, but our open enrollment was in the fall, and people's uh, decisions to change plans was for January. Um, so there was a little disconnect. And so um, this year is the year that we took to shifting that piece. Um, and so we had the 9.9% increase as of July 1st, and then we're looking at what may be coming uh, for January 1st, but then that rate will be for the next 12 months for the next month. So I give it to Mike. Um, and i that to Jill. So I just, um, I want to introduce Mike Baker from Group Alternatives. Mike Baker works um, for Group Alternatives and he provides uh, guidance and helps our, the district manage its plans. Many of you have met Mike, uh, whether it's on um, FAC or you've heard his name before. And um, because our board is, we have newer members on our board, um, one of the things that I always think is beneficial and I appreciate some of the members sharing this with me is you get insurance information filtered through various different groups, whether it's reading a contract, whether it's reading an, an email update from me, whether it's you know reading something from Todd. So to be able to have the opportunity, especially for, for members in the first or second or even third years of, of your terms to hear from Mike and be able to ask him questions directly about our plans, about any of the uh, rates that we set, why those are set, why recommendations are made, we thought would be uh, beneficial. And so uh, I know we are short on time tonight, so I want to turn it over to Mike, but I just wanted to introduce Mike and, and kind of the purpose of why we're all uh, here with Mike tonight. So, Mike, I'll give Great. it back to you. 
Thanks. Thanks for having me tonight. It's an honor to serve the great school district of Downers Grove. I've, I'll, I'm happy to answer any questions. So we just want to give you a quick overview. Stop me at any time with a question. Uh, so the first, with the new format, the first thing we wanted to highlight, you, I think you've seen some of this. This is what um, the Health and Well Being Committee has accomplished. And we are making progress. I know, you know, maybe it's been a high claim year for two years in a row, and we're starting to cycle out of that. At the same time, we can't. Healthcare is um, something you can't fall asleep on. So we are always watching. We've invested in analytics. We have lots of strategies that continue to help the district look for ways to save and not just shift the cost onto your members. So things that we have done, um, you've increased your teledoc utilization in the fourth quarter of 2018 the, the team really promoted that we added the value hsa on 1119 we only had 4.4 percent um, switch over and part of that is we've got to get members to meetings so we've been working with the unions and the health and wealth being committee to how do we get your members so they at least know their options and the value of hsa um, so we're working on that for this fall to drive that enrollment our you know ideal enrollment would be to get it over a hundred and keep growing and it actually is better for your members you know if you think about health care we all have to think of our health care expenses for the next 12 months however we're going to spend the most money on health care when we retire and the hsa if, if you're familiar with hsas or not hsa's the triple tax savings plan so your money goes in tax-free it grows tax-free and if you use it for health care expenses, it comes out tax-free. And so if you can accumulate, it rolls over each year. And if we can educate your members that this will roll over each year, you can grow it just like your, four, uh, your uh, 403B, other investments. When you get to Medicare, we can educate your members on how much Medicare costs. You can use your HSA tax-free to cover your Medicare premiums and all of your out-of-pocket. So what we're, we've educated your committee. There's a lot of benefits for your members. You know, the, the, employees of Downers Grove Grade School District to understand the value of HSA and start to save for retirement for their health care expenses. So that's a big accomplishment. We did switch to um, RX benefits and saved about five, we're, we're on track to save about 585000 on your RX. That happened in March. Again, RX is something that you cannot fall asleep on. We've actually found a new vendor as well that we're going to educate and reprice your claims on to see if there's further savings. And we are going to have RX benefits come out and meet with your committee sometime between December and February to review what we've already accomplished, but there's further savings that we can save on your prescription drug program. So that's coming. Uh, you added voluntary life. Todd mentioned syncing up the benefit enrollment with, you know, when, you, when your deductibles reset, have your rates set, have that all synced up. That will make it easier for your members to understand their benefits and make the change. And then we've added wellness screenings for this December. So again, if we can get a barometer of how healthy our members are and then get them to the right care at the right time and improve their health, they'll be better employees and they will also have uh, less health care expenses. And then finally, we're adding Livongo on 1120 as well. So Livongo is a diabetic program. It's free to your members. If you're a diabetic, there are nine different uh, care um, responsibilities that you need to do throughout the year and it's not just nine times it's multiple doctor visits it can be overwhelming if you have to teach you have kids you have you're pushed and pulled every way it's not fun to access the medical field so your members receive a free glucose monitor that's cellular it's live 24 7 they get free test strips for life and they have access to a diabetic coach so it doesn't repay, uh, replace their care but if there's something that if they're not uh, testing or they have a high reading their coach can reach out to them so on average per diabetic the program's net savings is over a thousand dollars a year in claim so we're excited that you know we're bringing that to uh, improve your members health and well-being so that's that's where we've been I have a quick question. Yep. Um, in some of the, the um, when you say, like, um, we have 20 employees on the value of HSA plan, and then in the same document that I'm, I'm thinking of in my head, it'll say we have 415 um, on the universal PPO. That's just employees. We're not talking about spouse and dependents. Is that correct? Correct. We'll show you the breakout of single and family, but not the, yeah. So we, we track by employees and do a per employee cost to track expenses, but we'll show you how many singles and families you have. Soon. So this is just an overview. This is what, this is your gross claims, and this is just a small chart. But we just want to walk you through. We do walk 
the committee through your claims every month and uh, we show them how the global plans running you know versus budget and then we show them by plan universal plan the high deductible plan and as as we get more folks into the hsa plan you will be able to um, you know it becomes more credible and we can see are we tracking the budget or not we hope we don't have more. So just to highlight, on, I won't go through all of this, but Todd wanted me just to kind of give you a brief overview kind of what we're tracking and what to look at. And what I look at, a couple of things, if you look at the top chart, the top box, this is your current plan year. So your plan year starts on July 1 and goes through 6.30. That's when your insurance resets. So you pay the first $150,000 on any claim and then instantly Aetna pays the rest. So that resets on January, uh, July 1st. So if we look at the top chart, you'll see that there's a light blue line. That's your totals year to date. The first column is how many employees are covered. So in, if you go right above the light blue line, if you look at July of 19, that's July of 19, you covered 473 employees on your health plan. Next to that is your medical, gross medical claims was 452,000 was paid in July of 2019. If you go straight down and you look at 2018, you can see July of 2018 was $908,000. That was a double. That was double the amount. You can see RX was 196, and then it was it's 216, and the, the RX is the next column. So you're, if you look at the medical RX combined, that's 668 thousand dollars for July. The amount over specific. That's the amount you pay the first 150 thousand. So there were zero reimbursements. There were no claimants over 150 thousand in July of 2019. If you go straight down in July of 18. You had $227,000 that did not leave the district's bank account. That was instantly paid by Aetna. So you had claimants already over $150,000 in the first month of the plan year. That's very rare. Right? So you, you know, think about a claim. My, it's very rare to have in one time, you know, my daughter had back surgery. She was in the hospital five days. She's fine. I, but it was $150,000 for five days. It's very rare to have that much. And you had $220,000 reimbursed. You can see that the, in August, we had zero reimbursed for this current plan year. And August of 18, you had 292,000. So you had money reimbursed every month last year for your large claimants. So individuals that are, you know, it could be, it could be a major surgery. Typically, it's a chronic, it's a, it's a cancer. It could be some other severe condition. Historically, you would see anywhere from three months to six months where you're not getting reimbursed any money in the, in the beginning of the year. So last year was a significantly bad claim year for large claimants. That cycles. Now we had, we had about a two to two and a half year period. So it is starting to trend a little bit better on the large claimants. Wellness isn't going to stop large claimants, but if, you know, part of our goal of wellness is we can make your membership aware of their health status. As your population ages, you can, you, you can prevent certain conditions from flaring up and having those large claims. So, and it, we're off to a good start this, this new plan here, having zero reimbursements the first two months. Uh, Quick question for you. Yep. On the uh, stopgap stuff, you mentioned that's a July to July. Todd, is that what we're going to keep even though we're moving? To, so that will stay on our, on our fiscal schedule? Yeah. We, yeah, we can look at it when you, you know, so you can always change it. And we, it's a risk equation. So as you approach January 1st, we can look at, you know, does it make financial sense? sense to the district. If you, you know, like last year, if you look at those reimbursements and we look at the claimants, you're now in full benefit. So any other dollars spent for the next, you know, six months, if you switched on January 1st, any, right. if, if we have someone to benefit and the claims ongoing, you look at the premium versus what the expected reimbursement is. And we would have told you last year, you're not, you don't want to make that change. If you're having a low claim year and there's not a significant claim, that's something that we can look at and say we can sync it up to the calendar year if you like. So that, that's something you can change, but it is, it is one of those risk equations and you actually could, could tell us to switch it for January as long as no large claimants flare up in December, right? So then we look you know, almost day by day and tell you, yeah, pull the trigger. Still likely the quote would not be beneficial to us after last year, so we'd probably have to wait a little bit. But I mean, it just comes down to pure economics that it makes sense to do it or not. Yeah. And there is just a, in the stop loss market, the stop loss markets are trying to figure out specialty 
dr the gene therapy drugs, not even specialty drugs. There's specialty drugs, and then there's gene therapy drugs. So a specialty drug would be Humira. So you see those ads for Humira. Humira came out for rheumatoid arthritis. We've educated your community on that. Humira came out, it was around two to $3,000 a month for a script, and now they uh, prescribe Humira for up to nine different conditions. And it is always in the top three of every client of ours on the drug spend, and the cost of Humira now is close to $6,000 per month. So that's Humira, but if you look at gene therapy drugs, I can't say the name of the drug, there was a drug that came out this summer, it was $2.1 million for the treatment. It's only for about 350 children a year, it's very rare. The challenge for the stop loss market and the insurance market is there is about five to 10 of these drugs that are gonna come out every year for the next five years, anywhere from a cost of 350,000 to a million dollars. And so the insurance market's trying to figure out how do we price for this? How do we build something? And so they will solve it. There will be a way that it calms the markets down, but right now that stop loss market, the, Premiums are going up, and they're, they're trying to figure out how to handle that. So that is one of the drivers of healthcare costs. And what's interesting, if you look at just from a, the cost of drugs have skyrocketed since the Affordable Care Act was passed because the lifetime limit was removed. So now the drug companies do know that there's no longer a lifetime limit on health plans. So the cost of drugs has escalated with that. Mike, is there a given time like a drug like Humira before the market can then create a generic? Is, is it a, a time period from the federal government or is it a patent? How does so, that work? So Humira has, they've gotten creative. Humira is a biologic and so it's not like um, Lipitor where it's a chem, it's powder, right? Lipitor is a powder drug where you can make a generic and it, it, the acting agents are exactly the same. It's just the filler that changes so you can, in that market, Lipitor was about $115 a month, $140. And the, when the generic came out, it dropped to about $20 for the generic. Humira is a biologic, and they can only do a biosimilar. And a biosimilar will not react the same way for your members. And biosimilars are very expensive to make, so that may come down a thousand to two thousand dollars. However, Humira is, cut a deal with a German manufacturer of a biosimilar, so that they get part of the profits, and they've started the patent how they, they patent not just the drug, but they've patented how you, um, it's in, there's, a, there's different ways you can administer the drug. They're, they're patenting that technology as well to keep the profits a little bit longer. So the drug industry, that's why we want your committee to meet with Rx benefits. We're constantly researching in different ways to how do we control the, the Rx cost, because that is a big driver of your medical costs. And there's other, we're, we're starting to also have some conversations with other self-funded organizations and governments and stuff about some format of ways that we can come up with and attack some of this on, on the RX side because it is not only costing more and more, but it's going to continue to go that route and whatever we can do. Um, you know, there's cooperative structures. You have to be big, big, big to do this. I mean, it's not like you're buying paper um, where you, know, you buy by the state, you know, you get a good rate. So we're working on trying to figure out how to do something there too. Okay, next one. So the here are your rates starting on these are your new rates that went in force July first of twenty nineteen. So you have your universal plan. So if you look at employee only, you have hundred and eighty one employees in the universal plan. That's employee only single coverage. And then Greg, your question, how many have spouses or family. So family coverage, we, you have a two-tier rate structure, so you have 233 individuals that have family coverage. So that could be an employee and spouse, that could be employee, spouse, and children, or it could just be employee and children. And we've, you could go to a four-tier structure, you have to get to the same uh, premiums going into the plan to fund costs. So if you switch, we've walked that through with your committee, if we switched, your full family rate would go up your employee spouse rate is just two times your single rate and the employee child rate's less than your employee spouse rate. So there's, a ch there's always a challenge because people will be affected, you know, someone's gonna be positively or negatively affected. So, because you still have to get to the, at the bottom, it's eight point, just under $8.5 million being put into the health plan. Um, 
you can see it, you have the reduced plan that was in place. So just kind of give you a history. The reduced plan was in place uh, for AIDS, just for something that they could afford. It's a different plan than what the universal plan was way back when. So that plan has not been touched. Uh, and that was created before you started working with group alternatives back in the late 2000s. The high deductible plan, that plan was added when the Affordable Care ta uh, Plan or Affordable Care Act was passed, and that was solely added, not really to have anyone elected, but to comply with the affordability piece of the law. So, based on your lower-paid employees, you had to offer uh, a plan that met the affordability. If you didn't, and we didn't know at the time, you know how good the exchanges would be. So. If they went out onto the exchange and they could collect a subsidy, if you didn't offer them a plan that was affordable and it's tied to the federal poverty level, it had to be within 9.5%, then you could be hit with a penalty of $3,000 for everyone that went out there. So we're like, why? Let's just offer a plan that complies with the affordability piece. We didn't really promote it. You now have uh, 15 uh, employees taking single coverage and five taking family coverage on that. So that that's how that plan was was put in place just merely to avoid unnecessary tax and penalties. And then we added the HSA plan. You can see we have nine singles electing that coverage and for employee family you have 11 on the new HSA plan. You have, I mean, just for the high deductible plan, we do have, I mean, obviously instructional aids um, you know, has a different pay structure um, and the different benefit piece. And in, in, in this last contract, um, they're their contribution, we've adjusted their contribution a bit so that the district pays up a little bit more, but they're still in that 50-50 range of paying the premium on the plan. So it is a fair, I mean, it's a catastrophic plan for those who need to have some level of insurance for them and their families, um, you know, as, as part of that. And you know, obviously we have some people that are taking it. Any questions on the rate structure? Just uh, looking at the reduced plan PPO, sorry, you might give them the headline for why that plan was designed or offered? That was, I think that's it. That one I don't have, that, that's. The reduced uh, plan was in place for AIDS that I don't, I think at a time they couldn't qualify for, I don't think they, there's a, there's a certain segment that can't have the universal plan, so that reduced plan was in place. So when we first started working with the district, I believe at the end of 2007, 2008, you had the universal plan, and you had the reduced plan for individuals that couldn't take the universal plan. Okay. Thanks. So we bet we've updated, and we're now that you have four plans, and really we're trying to you know drive enrollment into the HSA, so your members have a way to save for health care in retirement. For better consumers actually um, with the HSA contribution and premiums, they they win, and the money rolls over. So now we're tracking. Four boxes here represent projected claims. You have fixed costs. So if we look at the universal plan, the 2020 upper left box, you can see that projected claims, it's $1,582.16 times 12 months times the enrollment. So it's $7.8 million for projected claims. The fixed cost is $206.86 per employee per month. When you multiply that by 12 by your employees, the universal plan's fixed cost. So the fixed costs are your administration fees for Aetna to pay your claims. That's your network um, fee. Your, the biggest cost of that is your stop loss. So that covers your 150,000. So anything above that, um, you're reimbursed. So that's the million dollars expected RX rebates. So we switch to RX benefits. They pay you rebates. This is what they're expecting for the July to six. July 1 through 6.30 plan year, you're going to get 289000 We originally had, we had Aetna. We went back to Aetna multiple times before we switched to RX Benefits to ask them to Im improve their pricing on the ingredients of the cost of the drug and give the district rebates, and they did not get competitive, so that's why we went to RX rebates. So that comes off the way that that's just credited to your bills. It's paid quarterly, so those that 289000 is paid once a quarter, and it just comes off your RX invoice to the to the district. So your expected cost on the universal plan is eight million five hundred and ninety-eight thousand. And um, your twenty twenty. Um, if we didn't change funding rates, so what? So let me. This is actually your twenty twenty expected cost, right? So this is cost going from January through December. 
what we showed your committee is that the, the funding, this is your 2019-2020 funding, so your rates that went into force on July 1st, that's 7,837. So that would, that would be a 9.7% deficit. So that's the universal plan. Then you have the reduced plan. Mike, can I just interrupt for one second? Yep. I guess I'm slow catching up here. Can you maybe just talk about those two numbers, the 1,582 and the 206.86, how those were determined? Yep, so the universal, if you, if you go, if, if you look at your medical claims and RX claims that you're, if you look at, we take a rolling 12 months. So if, we, if you look at page three, um, and if you look at the bottom chart, the net medical RX column, which you spent in 2018, 19, the cost per employee is 1,000. If you look at the very bottom of the net medical RX column, which is the right. fourth there, it's 1,295. That's what you spent per employee per month for all of your plans. So we are trending that up for the universal plan. So what we, we track this by plan. So the 1582 represents what, you, we didn't show you all the plan costs. This is just the aggregate, but we take your, what you spent on the universal plan on a rolling 12 month average. We increase it for medical inflation. So on this, um, we used, uh, what do we use, assume? 13.5% divided by 12. So we used, yeah, we used a 13.5% trend line for your claims on the universal plan. Multiply that by your employees because healthcare inflation and how your plan has been running, that's, that's, we've increased that for inflation. Okay. The projected claims for the reduced plan, that's 675. So it's a different plan design. So that's based on the rolling 12 months of that plan plus trend. So in the Top chart there, that's the 675.79, so that's tied to how that plan's run plus the medical inflation. If you drop down to the HSA, the 506.64 is again based on the claims that have been paid. That's not a rolling 12 because the plan only went into effect on January 1st, so we have eight months. So we took the eight months, trended it up, looking out, and then you have the high deductible at 156. Um, and then the 206.86, that is you pay Aetna for administration every month and the stop loss premium. So they're billing you $206.86 per employee that takes health insurance every month. So they send that bill in to the business office and then they pay that out once a month. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Now what I'd say is when you look at this, so when you look at it, the plans all run differently. The only plan that insurance term is credible, which means you, you can kind of predict where the costs are headed is your universal plan based on enrollment. Sure. So if you look, if, if the HSA plan right now has 20 employees, if they had a $150,000 claim, it would change their cost on a per employee basis dramatically, right? So as the HSA plan, so it's, it's in surplus right now, one large claim could change that. Which, what we're shooting for is when you get to about 60, but really 80 to 100, now the HSA plan starts to become credible and it's kind of, you can start to dive into the data and say, what's, is the HSA plan priced properly? You know, is the universal plan priced properly? Which plan subsidizing which plan? The reduced plan and your high deductible plan, at those enrollments, they're, they're gonna hit home run some years for you and there's some years that they're gonna look like, look like they're not funding enough because there's just not enough employees in those plans. And then when I say once you have credible, you know, we just did this with one of our larger school districts. They have 2,500 employees insured, and they have 60% in their, you know, what would be their universal plan, and they have 40% in their HSA plan. So in that regard, those plans are credible, and are they are they sustaining? And what that district does is they use a, a margin of three to five percent of Air, right? So in any given year, you're going to have, you may have a bad year, but if you're within three to five percent, and you know we can work through that with the health and well-being committee, is like, what's the margin that you have from a proper funding standpoint? If it gets above five percent, then plans are subsidizing one another, and that, you know, every client has a different answer for that. Right? So if it's above five percent, then one plan's subsidizing another plan. Can you finish that thought though? So what do they, 
did they say that okay if that's if we cross that five percent threshold then they are going to adjust the premiums accordingly to get back below that five percent threshold or what was yep. the next step that they take so more yeah more and more uh clients are moving to having the plans make sure that they're sustaining themselves so I would say 80% of 80 to 90% of our clients have plans that are making sure that the rates are covering the cost of that plan within that threshold. And the number that you're suggesting to look at is this negative 9.7% should be below 5%. Correct. And the 50.6% should be below 5%. Correct. Now, what I'd say on the 50.6, just at this stage, is you only have 20 employees. Yeah. So, so. that one is just more noise than signal. Right. Okay. Well, with a high deductible plan, as you know, said, you know, you're, you're getting to a point. We see, we'll, we'll, so we may start seeing a few more claims coming in because people will start to reach their max out of pocket coming up in the fall, depending upon their circumstances. Yeah. You know, and, and, and you could have some claims. Not that you know, we have huge claims, but they get adjusted. So, you know, this year it's, it's happening a little bit late in the cycle because, uh, you know, you're more aware than me, you're in these meetings. It took a while to sort of get all of our units and, and get them into the Health and Wellness Committee and get them all onto sort of a, a unified plan. But when we discussed this and it, it started with contract negotiations and everything else like that, the goal really here is, uh, and it's one of the reasons why we've added the Health and Wellness Committee to our board updates, yep. is that we really want to be taking a look at these numbers uh, on a regular basis, probably deep diving a little more in, on, a, on a quarterly basis, similar to what we do in, in FAC for, for our budget, sort of looking at um, here was a, here's where all of our revenue has been, here's where all of our expenses have been, are, where we, are we at where we expect to be, are we trending high, are we trending low? Maybe this quarter is really high, but maybe you come right. in and say, yeah, but you're always high in this quarter because yeah. it's summer break and people get more things done during summer break because they're off, so they schedule a uh, you know, a non-emergency procedure or whatever during that time. And the goal really hit here is to move forward, is to, to, um, to be using your expertise and our, and our historical data and really to turn this into a mathematical formula. Obviously, we're not a for-profit. Um, so our goal here is to really be able to budget and control well where we are going so that when we budget for our year, all of our expenses, um, right. we can be healthy in our budget because primarily, you know, the way it was pitched to me when I first sat on the board was we were measuring it on the health of our, of our um, medical reserve fund. And so for a while, we had a real healthy medical reserve fund. So even though we were eating away at it, we, we were, I mean, there are several years, if you look at our expenditures, right. we had a very, very flat as far as, as, far as rates right. were concerned. So the, the idea moving forward was health care rates and premiums can be a contentious thing. And, um, people are very attached to their benefits, as, as, as I am as well. And, and so the goal here is um, to really utilize the math here and figure out and really help us project. And I think us as a board really want to be able to, for the first time, feel like we can hold into account some of those projections. How are we doing? What adjustments do we need to make? And that's where the health, when we were discussing the, the creation of this health and wellness committee, the idea was by having everybody sort of sit around the table, we can look at this together going, the, these expenses are growing and at some point can have a really, really negative impact on our district. So how do we find avenues that we can take to help reduce the cost? And, and, and this committee has done some of that with the examples that you gave. Yeah. But I mean, obviously there's things on the horizon like you're talking about the, the bio um, drugs and stuff like that right. that are, that are going to be a lot harder to measure and plan for. So really, uh, you know, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of pass this off to the rest of the board members, but I know that uh, for some of us, we went through that cycle. When we thought we would be approaching this year, what we were looking for was really um, is to work, with our, to work with that health and wellness committee to understand their needs and wants, and then ultimately for you to work with our, our finance team yep. and help us project and, and really kind of say we were behind, we were ahead last year, this is where I'm projecting costs to go, so this is how many dollars we really need in, the, in this fund. Um, to do that. And I know that's going to be a lot easier on, on the universal plan. Correct. Um, and that the, the, the new HSA plan is going to be a little bit more risky. So we definitely need to put more cushion in there. Yep. I think what we don't want to do is just um, 
arbitrarily fill that. I, I still want to use as much data as we can, and I know that there's going to be a lot more guesswork, so we, we're going to have to put some cushion in there to protect us. But and then I want to, as we go forward, I want to make sure that we continue to watch that and, and do that. So I think ultimately what, what we're looking for, and, and like I said, I'll pass this off, is, is to get where we think each of these individual plans should be so that we can be healthy right. um, going forward. Because we sort of changed that model in which we fund the, the MRF, and um, we need to make sure that that's staying self-funded. We don't want to get into, our, into a situation where we're trying to figure out now how we get additional funds into the MRF. So. Uh, I'll pass it around to the team here. Okay, so I couldn't agree with you more. We're happy. We we can get you a financial updates monthly. We send them, you know, so we can yeah. look at the format and get you updates every month if you want. Or quarterly will be definitely doable. So. Perfect. Thank you. Can um, we go back a few minutes? Can you explain that five percent thing again? What you're saying about one plan subsidizing the other if they're not between? I didn't understand that. Can you. So you're so you're self-funded. So. You know, we, when you look at projected claims on the universal, so on the universal plan, we're setting projected claims, and we add in medical inflation, and then we have your fixed costs. So on that expense, the one thing I can tell you you're going to spend is your fixed costs. Right? I can guarantee you that. I can't guarantee your claim costs. And with healthcare, you know, we can predict, and we've invest just a, we've invested in analytics. We have your data fed into our analytic system, we're mining that, and we're looking for low-lying fruit, we're looking for fraud, we are looking for ways that we make sure you're not paying anything that you shouldn't be paying. So, and we have the ability to kind of look and say, where is, you know, is the claim gonna be ongoing? So when we're, there's a lot of science behind when, you know, it's not just us taking a percentage and saying, we're just throwing it at the wall and saying, we think this is medical inflation. So we have a data scientist on our team that, you know, is, you know, working in this. However, that being said, I can't predict when someone gets sick, right? And, and you, can you, you can have a bad year. So the question becomes, what's the margin in that rate, right? So clients of your size, a 5% margin threshold is, is a good number to use. So give or take 5%, you know, if you're below 5%, if you had 5% if you surplus, it was a healthy year, we got lucky, right? If you have a 5% expense, it was a bad year, we got unlucky, right? If you're past that, so if you had a 10% surplus, the plan was, you know, we were charging rates that were too high, right? Yep. And if you had a 10% deficit, we, our rates needed to be higher on that. So we do a plus or minus 5%. So okay, but you're talking about one plan subsidizing the other. Right, so if, we, you know, if, if this- districts that have 60-40 split PPO HSA, what, is it, what do you mean by that? So that means they had, so in your, in your if, they, if you were 60-40, when I said 60-40, we yeah. would have, just to use easier numbers, we have 500 employees insured. Mm -hmm. That would mean you'd have 300 on the universal plan and 200 in the HSA. And so if, you, if, you ha if we have that, if we achieve that at, on the plan here at Downers Grove, now the plans are easier to predict. So that's where you say, okay, if, if we had this scenario where it's a 50% surplus, you shouldn't be raising rates on an HSA plan, mm -hmm. and you have a 10% deficit on the, on the universal plan. Those rates have to go up, right? right? So that's where the plans are standing on their own at that type of enrollment. Well, I guess the reason why I'm asking is I'm thinking about um, kind of my understanding and, and, and the board's understanding through um, negotiations which occurred in the summer of, of 2018 and, and the structure and the purpose of the committee. Um, and, and one thing we always were, were to understand was we don't have, I mean, for, um, for accounting reasons, we have one MRF. But for all intents and purposes, we have four. So we're monitoring the plans individually um, for their, their, their financial health. So um, the recommendation out of the Health and Wellness Committee, which I sit on as a liaison, was to um, do a flat, um, or an even uh, increase of 6.4% across three plans, not the, H, not the high deductible plan. And, and as the liaison of the committee, I heard from other board members following um, that, that update that weekend about the idea that one plan was subsidizing the other, the, um, the, the HSA plan was subsidizing the PPO plan. And my thought is, and maybe I'm wrong about this, but my question is for you or for Todd or for Kevin, 
Um, that's not really true, because we have, we're going to be monitoring each plan individually. So if we were to only increase premiums to the universal PPO plan by 6.4%, I'm guessing we'd have a, a $200,000 hole in the PPO plan. That's not going to get plugged from cash in the HSA plan. That's just that hole is going to persist. And we have to be, we would have to ha maybe have a good year for that to go away, or we would need to maybe double increase premiums a year from now, or maybe we would have to work with the Health and Wellness Committee to um, come up with some, some savings plans to, to, to reduce costs. But I mean, I don't believe philosophically as, as, a, as a board that one, uh, one plan is subsidizing the other. Is that correct? Or? Certainly at these numbers, they're not. Right now, what's happening, it seems like, and correct us if, if, if this is wrong, um, the district is subsidizing the PPO plan, right? Because that, that 761 deficit isn't being made by a surplus elsewhere on these four plans. It's being made plus by a surplus on, or a lot, in essence, budget from the district paying for that Well, you, I mean, deficit, based on, based on our projections, 91%. based on our projections, you do have the HSA and the high deductible it's $240,000 of surplus in those plans based on the rate structure. Now, there are only 40 employees in those plans, so a, a large, there's more risk of one large claimant happening on that plan that could wipe that mm -hmm. surplus out. But the way this is, we're mo we increased the HSA claims those the, on the, the 506.64. Right now, that plan's in the Four hundred dollar per employee. So we did increase that cost, but we didn't change the rates. So you're, you are getting a surplus from that plan. Um, the problem, the other, the other problem is that really you can't, because of the small size of the three plans. In in so much way, the three plans are subplans of the of the universal. Because we don't have one enough history with the HSA, which is the closest in structure and in benefit to the universal PPO, um, and the other two simply don't have the numbers. And so, you know, I want to be careful that, you know, we're in subdividing because if we get to ever decide, yeah, if we ever get to a structure where we have more than one, because I've had uh, five plans in effect in places. Um, we've had two PPO, two HMO, and an HSA because our rate structure and our system and our benefit system. Now, the, there's a large, a much larger employee contribution level, where that was very important to have that structure. Um, it really doesn't matter how many plans you have. Um, you know, it's the overall what is the benefit structure and people picking the right insurance structure. You know, for them, we have a limit as to how much and what we can do with this structure because, um, and I'll take the heat because I was sat at all the tables, because we simply don't have enough employee skin in the game. Now we moved, the, you know, we moved philosophically in the last three contracts from one spot to another as far as from a, do, a flat dollar to a percentage, but as long as we have a very small percentage of pay for some for a lot of people, we don't have people to look at what is makes the most sense. You know, when we buy insurance, we want to buy the insurance we need, not any more than we have to. That's for any type of insurance, medical or otherwise. Um, and and that's to me where one of the models we need to work toward. But. You know, we're not there yet, and so you know that's kind of the format that we're at. Is we've got one plan, three other pieces that are subsidiary. We hope to get to the HSA to a point where it's credible, so that it can then. I mean, because that premium structure is based off of the of the universal. When we set the premium structure for the HSA a year ago, it's 15% below the the PPO because that's what it looked like it made sense and worked. We don't really have enough 
to get a real number to say, okay, with this benefit structure, with this history, what does it look like when you have 100 people on it? Nope. I mean, I don't know if that confuses or helps, but... No, it does help. It's, and what you're saying is we can't compare plans to plans. We're comparing our health insurance to our overall budget. Uh, and right now, it looks like our health insurance is about 12% of our overall budget, uh, using the 8.5 million over 70 million. Um, I'd that, love that's your... total. That's not all. I mean, most of that is 90% of that's district, but that's not all district because this is everything in. This is employee and, and district contribution. Right, so 91% of that is. Yes. yes. Um, okay, so 10.5% uh, of that is, uh, or 10.2. Uh, but uh, I, I know that we have to probably move on, but it, uh, I guess I just have some advice on a general, like, how do we think about this? Is 10.2% of our overall budget the right place to be? I guess a, a, a question for us as a board is, what is our philosophy around how much we plan to spend for health insurance? And if we define that philosophy, then everybody can get on board with uh, how, do we keep, how do we have the incentives aligned uh, across employee bargaining groups, the board, the district administration on, here's what we want to be as a district, because then we can allocate the rest of these funds to um, uh, classrooms. Uh, and facilities and uh, and the other programming needs. But without that kind of guidance, I'm not surprised that we're at the place where we are because we haven't been giving groups guidance on the range we want to stay within. So when we have multiple plans where people are evenly in multiple plans, we can look at that 5% deficit or surplus. That feels like a right rule. We're not there yet, right? And so I'd love your advice or for this group's advice on um, what should we be looking at to know that we are on track? Is it the overall percentage of budget or some other number that we can be looking at saying, you know what, we're bleeding or we're saving to then inform a decisions that are much more minute than that on premiums and uh, you know, healthcare packages and so on. So uh, I guess that's to open up to the group, maybe your advice first on what you've seen work well. So I mean, as far as what your healthcare spend is as a percent of your budget, I, I don't have a number for you to say what every district does on yep. that. Um, and it, there's a lot of variables in that based on the age of the district, the unions, the negotiations, right? What benefits they drive. Um, so if you if there's a goal from the board, we you know we can show you multiple alternatives. That's the, that's our name, group alternatives, right? So if there's goals, we will show you different ways to achieve those goals. And you know you have balance the financial goals with attracting and retaining your employees, and how does that all work work together? So we can help you with that. So if you give us a, a financial goal, we can show you alternatives on how to achieve that. Well, I, I think one financial goal is we got to look at our last five years. We've run at a deficit for right. five straight years. So I think that's that's goal number one is to change that trend. Right. I mean, you're talking about on healthcare. Yeah, yeah cool. uh, absolutely. And I think that I think the model that, that we want to get to is, is there, there seems to be, we always are, are talking about what percentage we can in, increase premiums at. I really want to be thinking about it from what do the rates need to be and then, and then and, and you right. probably do this, but I, I want to have the discussion around that. Like this is, what, this is what amount of money we have to have in the plan and that equals um, X percentage. And I'm not saying that that's not the work that goes behind the scenes. We just haven't been presented it in, that, in that way before, and I, and I think for, for a lot of us as we've come on here, the um, one of the things I came in on when I when I first got elected on the board was um, there was a lot of discussion going on, and I started getting phone calls very quickly when I was on the board about our MRF fund, why it was funded this way, why a decade ago we took money out of it, and, and, and all this history on it that made me have to have a deep dive, like really do a deep dive in educating myself in our history. And I think um, there's a lot of emotions that can run around, that can surround benefits. And the, the goal here is, is not that that's never gonna completely go away, but how do we take this, and we just know that we do it in a very transparent and fair way. We have a conversation publicly. It's one of the reasons why the health uh, and wellness committee started and then why we wanted it as part of our board right. meeting so that people can understand when we're having discussions about it. There's no desire from the, the board whatsoever to make any kind of drastic changes anywhere except for the fact that at some point we're looking at some of these trajectories of costs and we're going, we're going to have to figure out how we maintain this because we're looking at overall budgets while we've been technically a balanced budget, it's barely a balanced budget right. and, and we really should be um, 
growing some of our accounts on CPI, and we're not doing that. So I would argue that technically we're really running a deficit, um, even though on paper we're, we're balanced. So the conversation is, I think, really is how moving forward, now that we sort of have a different structure in this, um, can you and our, our finance team work together while getting some input in from, from the Health and Wellness Committee to help um, with Health and Wellness Committee help control some of the costs and then really help us project really, really well um, what our expenses, obviously, if it, right, we have a year that's really, really bad, but I want to be able to talk, the reason why we're off this year is because, wow, we had this, in, you know, everybody got the swine flu this year, whatever, you know, whatever, right. you know, crazy thing, we can't always <laughs> predict that, but, but at least we go, all right, we understand the reason why, and, and then we adjust for that in, in a following Correct. year, but for all things remaining typical and normal, are, are we within our thresholds, I think that's what we're looking for, we just want to be able to predict what we're going on, so, um, when we have to predict how much staff we can afford and can we can we purchase this thing or that thing or the other that we're sort of we can feel confident in the decisions we've made correct and we we can we will give you the financial updates and i will i work with your committee a long time and you know when people are fearful of of change right and and especially with benefits in and the healthcare industry has drastically changed when if you even when you look back to uh, when your first plan started and so we are constantly showing the health and well-being committee you know here's how your plan works and the intentions and our goal is to have you have the best benefits that you can afford right however if, if it's structured incorrectly then you're being taken advantage of by the healthcare field right not and so it's we we've invested in analytics we keep showing the committee um Here's efficient ways to not take benefits away and taking mon not taking money away from your your members and driving your health plan to make it more efficient. That's our goal, right? We want we want a health plan that's efficient with great benefits, and so we're using the data and we have made a lot of progress. It's not as fast as you know maybe some would like, um, and as we continue to get that data, we can we can educate your community. Say, okay, here's how you don't have to. It's a different way of thinking, but we can get you to the same end goal. So that's what we're. We're working at, and then with your budgets, we'll make sure that you know here's here's where you're tracking. If it's off, here's why it's off. And for future budgets, if you give us a goal, we'll show you different ways to achieve that. So I got to uh, double back, I, and I, Mike, thank you for all your expertise tonight. But this question, I, I need to hear from the other board members on this one. So uh, we have a health and wellness committee meeting on on Wednesday, and I am the board's liaison to that committee. But I also feel like I should be that committee's liaison to the board. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the recommendation from the committee is a 6.4% increase to the universal PPO, which leaves us 3.3% short. As I have, I, I, I want to repeat that. Explain that. The part. recommendation from the Health and Wellness Committee for a premium increase to the universal PPO plan is 6.4%, which will leave us 3.3% shy of, of the 9.7, where Mike's numbers tell us we need to be. So I guess my understanding, as I've shared you, I just want to tell you if I'm if I'm if I'm, if I'm communicating correctly or, or not, um, like my, my thought that that leaves a hole in our plan that, that is going to persist year over year. It's not going to go away. We're not taking money out of, we're not moving money from the HSA plan into the PPO. That, that's, that hole has to be made up somewhere. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm focusing on this because, you know, you always hear about, you know, the state of Illinois or, or Washington, D.C. kicking the can down the road. We'll just worry about this next year. The same thing happened to our MRF uh, here, like we just we'll just kick it down the road. We'll worry. The next board will worry about the MRF. I don't want to get into a position into a position where we are we are annually underfunding the PPO and making that plan um, insolvent. Maybe not insolvent, but maybe a little bit too dramatic. But making it not fiscally healthy to the position where um, several years on the road we're not able to provide the quality of care that we want to for our employees. So. Am I, am I correct in, a, in, this, in thinking, and then only you guys can tell me the answer to this question, am I correct in thinking that we need to, that we are looking at these individually, that we have four different plans that we are monitoring year over year, year in, year out, and if we, if we don't, if there is that hole that's not coming from other employees and other plans, it's going, it has to be made up another way. I'm hoping I'm making sense. If I'm not, let me know. What I'm looking for is a data... 
I, you know, I, I'm glad that this conversation is happening in the Health and Wellness Committee, but what I'm really looking for is a data-backed recommendation on what those individual rates should be for really eight, yeah. right? There's what, eight. Yes, what, what is your recommendation? Like, if I understand there's a, a committee in place. What is, you're the professional on who we have managing our plan. What is your recommendation? Right, so I can so, put you on the spot. I mean, we, as a group, we, you know, they, they landed at the 6.4. It's, it, if you increase three of the four plans to the 6.4, it's, it's, uh, you're shortchanging the plan um, about, uh, there's about $150,000, uh, I think it's about $150,000 potential deficit. So that's, that's within the, Three to five percent margin, you know. Had you know now, hist because you haven't hit your, you know, that's the you haven't hit your budget or below your budget the last couple of years. So I think that's the that's the concern, right? So. Um, and and I'm glad you're I'm glad you're having the conversation, but I think ultimately our goal is to have the committee's not a group of experts, right? It's 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 the people that are impacted by right. the plan and are having a discussion. I think ultimately we want you and our financial team to, to come up with something that we can own and measure and, and have somewhat of accountability behind uh, as well. You know, like, I'm, not that we have crazy claim, you know, that's right. not what I'm talking about. It's not, it's not meant to be a gotcha moment, but like, we just want to be able to have, uh, I think so we I, feel like th th certain things have been arbitrary and maybe we haven't listened to you in the past. I don't know. So ultimately, you know, I'm looking for eight numbers, you know, when we get a recommendation of this is our rate recommendation for, for single, this is a rate recommendation for right, so, family in each one. So, you know, years past, there's been times not, you know, I'm not going to say years past, we've said, we suggested different structures and, you know, based on pressures or whatever, different rates went through. Um, based on how you're starting this year and knowing that we told the committee that they, there's further savings on Rx by switching to different formularies and looking at that. Um, you could live with the increase that was recommended as long, you know, with the start of the year and saying we are going to potentially, you know, if, if they're willing to change formulas for additional savings when they meet with RX benefits, you could probably squeeze out that extra 150,000 in RX. Could I ask a question on, I heard 9.7 and I heard 6.4. Do you mind giving us a background on where the 9.7 percent, so what it was made us? So if you look at. One. Universal PPO deficit. Oh, that. I see. So what happened is the committee looked. The committee looked up here and said, at, "We're 9.7, 14.9 deficits for the top two plans. The bottom two plans are in surplus. So we then it did the bottom box. Your overall costs are. Got it. So they the committee voted 6.4 percent increase across all plans except for the one for the affordability piece. Um, so that's how we landed to the 6.4. So so a 6.4 across the board isn't going to be a. Um, you know, you're, you've, on the HDHP plan, that's, that's the lowest revenue, or it's the second lowest revenue going in the plan. So you're, you're really losing, let me just figure this out, 30. So your, your deficit on the, on the 6.4 increase there, you're hitting the other. So it, it's, it's around $100,000, $150,000 potential deficit that you're looking at um, by doing that. You can make that up in Rx knowing so here's one of the things. You have an open formula. We've talked to the committee about closed formula. We had a good meeting last time. They're open to reviewing that. If you switch to closed formula, there's $100,000 of savings on the table in the next plan here. You know, you'd have to switch to that. Um, if you get more people into the HSA at open enrollment, there's, you know, if we get people to the meetings and we get a big shift and we can hit 80 to 100, that's going to change your your budget and your claim costs and how people use the plan. So there's a lot of things, you know, the committee's made a lot of progress um, and your first two months of the year are down significantly from how you started the prior two plan years. So you're, you've kind of leveled off. So that's where, had you still been ramping up and we weren't making progress, I'd absolutely tell you, you should, every plan should sustain the 9.7 and the 14.9. To understand the, 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 the difference on the PPO and the HSA, so if you have 20 people, because the deductible, and I know we're running out of time, we're over to the limit, 
But uh, if we have 20 people move, your deductible for family on the universal plan is $500. The deductible on the family for the HSA is 5,000. 4,500 times 20 is, is $80,000, you know, $80, $90,000. That moves that much of that liability and that cost impact off of the universal onto that HSA. Uh, and on to and on to the employees because of that structure. Um, so obviously that's that helps. I think it's one of the reasons why they don't want to overly burden that plan if it if it's not necessary. <clears throat> and right, that's that is. I mean, and 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 as part of the committee's recommendation to help incentive that, um, their recommendation was to increase uh, the uh, contribution into the HSA. Uh, you know, 250 for single and 500 for individual, or 500 for family, so that it would help kind of drive that piece, um, you know, into that for, for more people. And now we've had 20 people in it, we've all mostly, I think, had good experiences and talking to their co colleagues and stuff. So we're working to try to really build that as an organic form. Which of the three plans that are 6.4 recommendation? Is it? Was the... Was everything, everything but, but the HDAP. The yeah. HDAP yeah. is that high deductible, is that, that okay. call it catastrophic or bronze or ACA plan. And what's the. Give me a lens into the thinking of that group. I wasn't in the meeting. So, what's the reason to land at 6.4 versus 9.7 and to land at the. That's, those that's three what plans. Came at, so they were sure, yeah. but why? Why? What was the reason to like? Yep, let's go to six point four as opposed to nine point seven, and what was the reason to recommend increasing it uh, four three plans as opposed to one plan or two plans? I think um, well, the two the PPO plan, the the reduced PPO plan is a negative piece. So obviously, you know, so that one going up as well. Um, I think the 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 piece on the HSA uh, and to increase that the committee's uh, opinion was because it's only got eight months in because it's a new plan um, and because you know it has the possibility of a couple of claims upending it not having a full year or better um, their rec their reasoning was to recommend to, to increase that uh, in the same format as the PPO and the reduced PPO, um, you know, at the same piece. Um, just given that it's it's newness and it's it's small size. The part that I'm interested in is ultimately getting to a guidance that we can give everyone, and we're all on the same page of here's what we want to do with premiums. Right now, like I don't feel like we're giving good guidance by saying let's look at that number and then let's increase all plans by that number because that's actually not getting us to Steve's point of getting us to like turn the deficit around. Uh, it's actually increasing the deficit right now, right, by about 3.2%, um, or 3.3. And so what I'm looking for is this 9.7 is also a projection based on, I'm guessing, five years of history or number of years of history, or is it just the last year of history? It's your most recent 12 months and then we increased it for medical inflation, and we used a little higher medical inflation than normal because of your trend line. So we we did had this number, and you started out better. So um, that's it's a conservative estimate versus you know yeah you know maybe two years ago. Conservative in the sense of making sure that we have funding for it and that we are. You know, I, I would tell you this. I'd say, you know, you've made, you, you've got momentum. You know, part of the committee is like, we're in this together. Um, if if we can get your membership to meetings and you can drive enrollment in the HSA and we can get the data, I've seen, you know, I've seen many of our districts, you know, they started here and, you know, teachers are fearful of HSAs. They, you know, people, there's a, there's a stat from uh, one of our technology companies. People will spend three to five days researching a vacation you know, two to four days buying a computer, and they spend 27 minutes or less on their health care, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and it affects their retirement, it affects their paycheck, it affects their, you know, it, it affects so much of their life. And your HSA plan is a very good plan for the vast majority of your employees. It's not necessarily the best plan for all of your employees. And we've been working with the committee to 
how do we get your membership to the meetings? How do we're very good at educating? If, if we can get your members there, your employees there, we can educate them. We're not going to get everyone over. We're you know I've seen this with other districts, but if we can build that momentum and then get you the data and show show the committee the data, the data speaks for itself, and then it makes these conversations a lot easier. So that's the you're balancing the momentum we have versus the rate increases, and you've made a lot of progress. If we can, if if you look at the screenings and getting that data and you know driving enrollment and we if we can get to 80 to 100 you know we want your members to get to the meeting so they know their benefits you offer them great benefits on you know health care so how do we help them understand them and get them in the right plan and then take that data and say here's how it's working and then it makes this a lot easier for us to kind of how do we set those rates real quick I want to wrap this up in like five ten minutes so we can bring in our next guest but um, and that is an important role of the Health and Wellness Committee is to, to find out what plans are better for people to make sure. You're, you're absolutely right. Like, uh, one plan may look fantastic, because of it, but it may not actually be the best thing for you because if you can build up that HSA account, uh, I know a lot of people that are fresh out of college that got that HSA, never visited a doctor for six years, have so much money sitting in there, they're in, they're in great shape. And you're right, you get the triple benefit on taxes. I think where, where I am, and, and and any of the members that are um, newly on the board um, that weren't here when we first started negotiating this, I think one I'm not really looking for. I'm not really looking to the committee for ultimately for the recommendation. I'm looking to this table right here, and I right. plan on attend, uh, holding this table accountable for the work, not not necessarily the committee because they're not experts in this. You're our experts in our finances, and we bring you in to, to be here on that. So I. So ultimately, no matter how this gets worded to us, that, that's sort of where I'm, I'm, I'm putting the ownership. I'm big on ownership, who owns what, and, and this is where I see the ownership on our, on our plans. Um, others may feel differently, but that, that's how I'm seeing it. But the, the other part of it that I just want to take into account and get a feel for, and then at some point, I'm assuming we'll get the final recommendation from, from the two of you on, on what we should um, implement for, for 2020 is, if we're optimistic and we think that we can make up $150,000 through, through Rx benefits and, and things along those lines, that's great. Um, what is our risk if we don't? Because we're bound with a maximum number, a maximum percentage on which we can increase. And um, we don't have other money. We're not going to take money from another fund and transfer an MRF to make up. So we're going to have to make that up at some point. So if we're we're down three or four percent, five percent, and then we're projecting another six, seven percent in growth for the following year. We can't do that. We're bound without having to, to open up our contract and do everything else like that. And, and, and that's just not something we want to put our, mm -hmm. our our staff through. You know, like ultimately we want this to be a very predictable experience for them. So if wherever the numbers suss out, I want you to be confident in, in looking at these things, whether or not they all have to be somewhat related or not. I want you to look at, I want to be looking at the individual funds and say, for us to really be confident in, in each of these plans, this is how much we think a premium should be in each one of them, and that we can be safe and stay within those bounds for next year, because the last thing we want to do is have to do something radical going into 2021, because um, we didn't plan now right. when, when we have we have, we, you know, we, we looked at some of the extremes when we put our budget together. Now, there is nothing I would like more since 91% of this premium is paid by this board. That alleviates a little bit of pressure on us right. if our premium is lower. I'm not looking by any means to, to increase that number. I just don't want to get ourselves into trouble as we go into 2021, and I don't want to see um, an ongoing deficit build up where we're, we're having um, an overall too far of a reduction in our, in our MRF. So um, that's just sort of my closing thought on all that. So um, let's go around the table. I'll just react to your point around where the recommendations come from. I think the Health and Wellness Committee are the right stakeholders to ultimately make a recommendation informed by this table. Uh, but I don't want it to be a different recommendation from this table than what the Health and Wellness Committee is coming to. Um, this, we're self-insured for a reason. We think that that will keep costs low, and this should be owned by all stakeholders in the system. 
Uh, I don't want it to feel like it's the board and this table making a decision regardless of the committee that we just tasked with making a recommendation. So, uh, just to be clear, that was not, sorry, uh, that is not their role, is not, uh, it's their role and our role. This is one of the few things that we're bound to do that technically is board work. We just don't have the skill set to do it. So, what's, what is our, what's the role? Our role or their role? Our, our role is to set a rate for right. the premium. And there, we created the Health and Wellness Committee because of the skyrocketing cost. The idea was to create a committee to help find um, ways that they could work doing things with DRS plans or, or you know, the Lavongo or whatever the name of that company was. Find ways to, to promote wellness in the district to, to help stem, because we had, we had some crazy years in, in cost. I, so, I have a question about that. Yeah. You can finish your... No, go ahead. When you talk about create, okay, so I'm, I'm new to the board. I just started in April. When I was looking at um, starting in 2011 and on, there was, we were, the deposits were under, uh, we didn't have enough money. We were in a deficit. Year over year, lots of money, like $530,000 in 2015, and no rates changed. In 2016, we were underfunded $242,000. Am I reading that correctly? And the rates didn't change. The next year, $412,000, and the rates just changed to 5.5. Over the, that time, I don't know if that was before you being with the district or working with the district, is there a reason why nothing changed all those years, even when it was underfunded? Did I just open it? I, I don't understand. Yeah, so we made recommendations that not necessarily were, you know, we showed costs that, but then there was budget items that had to be decided, so they didn't go in, you know, we can make recommendations, but they didn't go into place. They were, they were not heated, your recommendations. Okay, perhaps you recommended rate increases and they did not Correct. follow through. Correct. Okay. Which is why we're here. Exactly. And that was, that's my understanding. Yep. And I think... Uh, I think that uh, we're all on the same team. We're all here to like be, we're all trying to do the right thing by our staff and our students. Uh, and th there's no intent on my part to make it a us versus them situation. And what I meant by the Health and Wellness Committee being charged with giving recommendations, it's around recommendations around what we could do to stem healthcare costs, but also to give recommendations on what we, at least from my understanding, we've given them the task of recommending rate increases. We ultimately get to vote on them, and we can decide to choose or not choose the recommendation. But I think the direction that we've given them is to, uh, we've asked them to recommend us rate increases. We get to decide on them. Is that not accurate? That we No, we were supposed to bring rate increases to them, and then the idea was hmm. if, as we had high rate increases, we, we, were, we had fears that, that rates could continue to skyrocket. And the idea was to bring them into into the fold to discuss, are there ways, are there things that we can do, like switching the RX plan or whatever, where we can curb some of the cost and maybe take some of the pressure, but ultimately this was supposed to come down closer to a mathematical formula yeah. because of the years that we've had where we're talking about larger increases right now because we weren't where we were supposed to be for several years, and the fear is we cannot continue on that trajectory. You're absolutely right, it's not an us versus them, the, the idea the, the thought in my head is, is try to turn this into a math formula as much as possible yeah, and, and then use the committee to try to find ways to stem costs that could potentially then reduce that further yep. in, uh, in the future or in the current if, if possible. But not in general just say, um, just pick a rate. Like I, I, wanna, I want the rates really to come up. You know? An expert. I can't pick a rate either. So the purpose of the committee also, is it also an education piece so that they go and, and they're all stakeholders and they know how their fellow stakeholders will respond. Because I know personally, when my husband's open enrollment is happening, it's 10.30 at night and it expires at midnight and we don't change anything. And we're like, oh, well, this just worked and this is what, and we just stay with it. So like the education piece of it seems like if, you, if we're looking to really educate people on the HSA plan, it looks like there's some things that are in place to, to try educate people, but what what is the recommendation of the Health and Wellness Committee and you, Mike, to, to, to educate people so that they're not waiting until 10.30 at night at, for a midnight deadline to make a, 
a change. Correct. So our, um, so I, did, our, I mean, our staff last year, we, we went to different schools. There's a schedule. Um, I don't know if the schedule's up. I'm trying to get to it. We did we did meetings before we did meetings before and after um, school. Our staff is av available for one-on-one -on -one phone calls to walk people through any questions. Uh, so we have a nice PowerPoint that outlines one what an HSA is, their plans, how they work side by side, what their minimum liability is, what their maximum cost is when we factoring in premiums, factoring in the HSA, showing them how to be good, good consumers, how to navigate the healthcare system, how to pick a doctor, how to you know, so it, it, it's an extensive education and it really opens people's eyes. So our, our team has been committed. So last year we went to four or five schools? Three. We went to three, three schools. Three, but then we videotaped as well. Oh, okay. However, however, there was only... We probably hit... 30 people? 30 people at one. We probably hit at most 50 to 60. Um, and, and I want to say the one that we had the largest turnout, um, the association uh, moved and adjusted their union meeting uh, to later in the day so that we were able to carve out some open enrollment time in, in for a meeting. And we did that right at the same spot. So that helped out to bring in, you know, 30 plus people into that into that session. Um, but yeah, and then we videotaped and put it on, on the website for people to be able to go on and watch. Uh, as well as documents and so forth. So, um, it, it is a piece that we need to work actively, and that's a conversation that I think we're going to have as an administrative team, uh, how to try to increase that. Um, you know, um, we do a fair amount of email, paper, mail, mail, um, communication pieces about benefits. Um, the teledoc thing we saw this huge increase. Um, in large part is due to um, Regina in our office who did raffles for gift cards and all sorts of things to really increase the amount of that, and that has reduced uh, significantly from the cost. So, so just to jump in and piggyback off of something that Todd said, I, Todd and I just met this morning about um, after meeting with, with several of the different associations last week, uh, Jane and myself, about how can we further education, um, education around the plan so everybody has the best decisions. I want to thank our associations. I, I know Craig is here. That was a, a big conversation piece that we had last week and um, one that we are going to start um, really brainstorming over the next week or when can we have opportunities where we have the largest number of people available to hear the educational uh, pieces. And I know we've got representatives from all three of the associations who are willing to assist with that. And um, so we're going to be bringing that up at our administrative team uh, meeting tomorrow. Okay. And then also reaching back out to our associations again to make sure that when we do have this uh, valuable information for staff, uh, to make sure that we have a large audience so everybody can make the, the most informed decision possible. So that is something that's being in the works. And, and like I said, I know all of our associations are very committed to that educational piece. And it's beyond plan picking, by the way. It's about talking about how Teladoc can help, and when when you use urgent care, and when you see a, a, you know anything that you can do to to sort of normalize care and get people actively thinking about that. That can help us control costs, and then ultimately pass those savings on. Again, we're not a, a for-profit insurance agency, right? Like what it costs, it, it, it costs. So. Well, um, I want thank to say you. we did that opening day with the staff, with certified staff, and uh, Mark White uh, hit a few rooms. I hit, you know, we all hit, we all took different rooms, the administrative team, to make sure we got to everybody and just, you know, do this, do, you know, read, make sure, that type of thing. So we we really try to increase that. And I, uh, I just want to, I did miss, I did misspeak. So if you do the, the 6.4 percent increase, so if you hit the universal plan, the in the 6.4, it's not 150,000 bogey that we have to make up. So if I, I just, I'm just going to, if you increase the 7,837,056 times 1.064, you know, that's going to take you to 8,338,000 based on enrollment. And when you add in just, if you add in all the other funding from the plans without even touching them, um, it's not that big of a hole. So with the conservative trend and knowing that the committee's momentum, that, that gets you so we're at 8947 if you just hit the universal plan 6.4. And they, they want to be in it all together. And we've made a lot of momentum, right? So 
we, we threw out, the, the committee debated back and forth. I mean, it was a passionate argument, and there's valid points on both sides, right? So the, if increasing just the universal plan 6.4 would have a deficit projected at $40,000. With the 6.4 going on the three, the universal, the reduced, and the HSA plan, that picks you up another 29,000. So you're looking at a, at about a, you know, 6.4 across the plans. Philosophically, whether you, you know, it resonates with you or not, right? You're looking at about a 10 or 12, 10 to 20,000 dollar deficit by doing that. We can that that's a rounding error on the 8.9 million budget with all the momentum you've picked up and trying to get folks to um, the HSA. You've got the wellness going. We've got uh, plenty of opportunity on the RX. You're on an open formula. You can go to a closed formula and save significant dollars. So there's a lot. You know. So I I apologize for miss you know not doing the math ahead of time on the like that okay. bogey. But you know I understand you know wanting the support the plans and you know I I agree with that um, that being said I, I number one priority is getting people into the HSA plan getting the data and educate continuing to educate everyone on that so just to clarify really quick I just want to make sure I understand what you just said so you're saying if you only increase the rate 6.4 percent on the universal PCO and you didn't increase any other rates we would have a forty thousand dollar deficit correct and then if you increased all the other plans except for the um, high deductible one. If you increase the the three plans six point four percent, we would have a ten to twenty thousand dollar deficit. Correct. Is that correct? Okay. Thank you. With, with all yeah. the districts yeah. that you um, work with, uh, given that the HSA plan is only what is it nine months old, is, is that is that a decent showing or is it? No. No, it's on the lower end. For for but I'm talking about in the time spectrum of how long it's been going. Compared yeah. to other, like it's a, it's all it's all dependent. It's on the lower side. It's on the lower side. Okay. It, it's and it's driven primarily on education, right? So it's getting people to the meetings. Uh, that is the. If we could get eighty percent of your population to the meeting, you get closer to fifteen mm -hmm. to twenty percent shift. Um, um, all right, we're, we're way over on time. So what I'd like to do is, sir, I, first of all, thank you so much for, for being here tonight. This is sort of last thank minute. Thank you so much. Um, what I'm, I know that the Health and Wellness Committee is meeting on Wednesday, so I'm hoping that we can have uh, some final recommendations, and we'll, we'll be looking for that uh, coming out of there. Uh, if there is any questions from a board member, either prior, remember that uh, we're going to be really pushing up against the next board meeting where we're going to, have any rates? So if there's any questions that you want to get um, over to them, you know, get those sent in um, through Kevin, and we'll make sure that that everybody gets the, the results of those those questions, and we'll go from there. But ultimately, what we're really trying to do here is just really kind of make sure we can stabilize and, and figure out and, and make sure that this is a formula that's fair, transparent, um, in a way so that we can just provide. Aaron, this is. It's yeah. Jill, just super fast. You said they're meeting this Wednesday? They are. Okay. Thank you. Do you have any other questions? Nope. All right. Do you have any questions for us? No. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I appreciate much. you being here. Thank you. Mike, thank you. You're welcome. All right, why don't we take a quick five minute? We'll go and we'll get the, the folks to come in and we'll pick back up here at. Oh, actually, probably about 745. This is from third party consultants for facility planning, community engagement. Oh, no, thank you so much. First up, we're going to be welcoming Beyond Your Base. It's a consulting group of White and Company. So I don't know if you guys want to go across the table. I, I know I just met all of you, but you want to introduce yourself to the rest of the team? I'm Marcia Sutter, so um, I am your local boots on the ground. I live here in Illinois, and I'm looking forward to telling you more about what we do here. And I'm Jim Hobart. I'm a pollster with Public Opinion Strategies based in Alexandria, Virginia, and have uh, worked with Paul and Marcia on a whole host of referenda campaigns here in Illinois. <laughs> Sorry. And uh, I'm Paul Hanley, Manager Director of Beyond Your Base, and 
uh, I would manage the whole team as far as uh, services to the district. Um, I've spent the last 27 years working with cities, counties, school districts, community colleges, and special districts um, in Illinois and a variety of states uh, nationally. And tonight, I'm hoping we can uh, share some insights on our approach and then answer any questions that you might have. Um, we normally do a, uh, we do a three hour workshop that some of you have attended. Um, we're gonna try to compress that into 10 minutes if that, if that will work. Um, and then during the presentation, we're happy to, to field questions. So do you, can we just jump in or do Go you right have ball, okay. you're so, awesome. um, Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. So um, there are two handouts tonight that you were provided in your package, but these are easier to see because they're 11 by 17. Um, and the first handout is basically an approach that um, I have used for the last 26 years. And it's something that a gentleman named uh, Rick Ryder brought to me uh, a long time ago. And we have continued to refine it year after year. Uh, refine it when we win, refine it when we lose. And so um, basically it's broken into four parts. So uh, the first part is doing your homework needs assessment. Uh, the second, second phase is sharing that homework with the community. The uh, third phase is asking, asking the community, what do you think? And most importantly, would you pay for it? And then lastly is the campaign phase. Um, the first three phases can be paid for by the district. However, any information that's mailed out, we recommend that you have it reviewed by your attorney. Um, it's not advocacy, but we don't want to cross any lines. Um, and then the last phase, phase four, uh, would be paid for by a campaign committee. So a group of concerned citizens would have to come together to advocate for the measure. Um, you could not use taxpayer dollars to advocate in, fa in phase four. So tonight, I wanted to just go hit the highlights of some of the details on our approach and then have you ask any questions that you might have. So as far as doing your homework needs assessment phase, the first thing we want to do is a voter analysis. In fact, we already did a voter analysis for you, and that was the other, the other handout. And I'm not going to go line by line because that would burn up my 10 minutes. Um, but I just want you to know that the reason we do this voter analysis is that we're trying to figure out who's a likely voter versus an unlikely voter. So that when I work on a mail survey or Jim does a phone poll, uh, we're targeting likely voters. So we'll, go, we'll talk a little bit about the mail survey, but it's particularly important with the scientific phone poll that we're polling people who are going to show up to vote for the particular election that you're thinking about. So in this case, the November 2020 election. So that's what this data, we, you know, if you had questions on the data, I'm happy, happy to address it. Um, but that's, that's what this is about. So as far as um, needs assessment, the next thing is for the district to identify what I call your plan A and plan B. Plan A being what you truly believe voters would support. That's what I consider a plan A. And a plan B is ratcheted back from that where you kind of wish you didn't have to put it on the ballot, um, but it addresses many of your needs and so you do. That's kind of my, my uh, rule of thumb for a plan B. Um, in the case of District 99, who we worked with, um, they had a plan A and a plan B. Their plan A was 136 million. Plan B was 82 or something. Um, and so uh, after doing all this work, we determined that there was support for that larger <coughs> measure. And so they ended up putting that on the ballot. In fact, the, and Jim can talk about the polling um, was dead on in terms of what we had predicted and what the final results were. Um, next thing is, as far as doing the homework, just assembling any supporting information that you have. Um, whether it be uh, work from the architect or construction manager, et cetera. Um, we help you develop your core message, which, which is oftentimes what's the problem, what's the solution, what's the cost, why is it urgent, and what's the value added. And when I say what's the value added, what's in it for the person who doesn't have a child uh, in school? So we have to think about that messaging. Um, we also recommend you uh, recruit a citizen task force and so these are typically business leaders, civic leaders, major property tax uh, payers, uh, faith-based leaders, uh, persons in the community who truly have a voice in the community. Um, 
it's typically 30, 35 uh, people participating, and um, the goal is for them to vet the proposal. So um, you have two options. One is they can decide, the board would allow them to decide what is shared and tested district-wide. The other option would just be that they provide recommendations to the board. Um, so in the case of District 99, they decided that the, the board decided that they wanted to make the final recommendation on what to share and test. And so it was truly um, just recommendations uh, from, the, from the task force. Um, so at that first task force meeting, we typically um, cover all the needs of the district and all the, all the homework that you've already done, the planning efforts uh, completed to date. It's kind of a big data dump. And then at the second task force meeting, um, we share with them what the proposed solutions are. So this might be your plan A and plan B and other details. But you have one kind of thing that's different that we think needs to have more attention paid to it, which is the whole um, six, eight, um, moving sixth graders in with, in the, with the middle schoolers. And so um, we think in the perfect world, you'd have the citizen task force vet that and determine whether it would be shared with the community early on and tested, or whether it would be kind of part of the whole bigger proposal that's tested later on. So that would, that would you know, again, we would seek guidance from the board on that, as well as, if you're willing, uh, guidance from the task force. So if, if we did right away want to test whether that was a good, good idea of mixing sixth graders with seventh and eighth graders um, and going through that with the community, um, this is where Marsha would step in as part of it to do some of the, um, the community outreach meetings. I'll have you talk a little bit about that. Sure. So before we can really test if people support something like a six to eight concept or any concept, we need to explain to them what it is. And in the case of changing the configurations of your schools, I think we would want to present to them the educational justification why is it good for sixth graders to be in a middle school setting instead of an elementary school setting and at those meetings we would also really listen hard to what do parents and other community members think about this concept so that we can use that information to refine the idea and test it further later on so the goal is to see People might be overwhelmingly in favor of it, and I don't have all of your information yet um, about why this is good for sixth to eighth graders, but we would want to take that out in dedicated meetings, probably at every building, and then um, do some research, both qualitative and quantitative, around the concept. And then, um, again, typically we don't do a benchmark survey on a topic like this, but given how it could derail everything going forward. We think it might be worth it to do a, a community opinion survey early on just to test this subject. And so that's where Jim would, would come in in this process in the beginning. Yeah, so in this case, it would obviously be a, a pretty short survey. It would be a lot shorter than the survey like we did that we will do later in the summer as you get closer to actually putting something on the ballot. So here, what we would really be looking for is one, like Paul says, hey, is this something that there is some support for, or is it a, a deal killer from, from the word go? And uh, so that would be the main focus. And then just some kind of what we call atmospheric questions to see what general feelings are all towards the district. And then, of course, demographic questions as well to make sure that we were, had a representative sample. We'd bring the task force back together. If, if we decided to branch off onto this, uh, they would make a final uh, decision on, in terms of recommendations, um, include the 6-8 component in the full package, or don't, don't, go, don't, don't go down that avenue. Um, next part is you would share this informa the, the core information with, the, uh, with your voters. Um, again, starting with all your employees, making sure they're always part of the conversation. Um, we typically do a letter and an attachment to every registered voter household. We do an FAQ newsletter to every registered voter household. Um, we do community presentations, assisting you with those. Marsha, again, would be involved in those community presentations. Um, you're looking for uh, ongoing earned media. Um, we, you know, some, some districts do a video. We'd be happy to assist you with a video as well. 
um, updating your website, social media, any way to get the word out on what your plan is. And then lastly, phase three is we ask the community, what do you think? And again, most importantly, what would you pay for it? And so um, a, when we do uh, community presentations, um, Marsha is involved in kind of some of the in-person online input following those meetings. Right, so we look at those meetings have a dual purpose. First of all, to, they're to share the information about your plans, but before we, uh, and so after we do that, we collect information from the people who are attending, and that comes in a number of different ways, typically an online survey afterwards, but more important, conversations with people at the meetings where we ask them questions, we listen to what they're saying, and we use that to inform an FAQ and the ballot question so we can really learn what is what are the most important aspects of this plan to the taxpayers and to your voters. So, um, yeah. Um, the next item is a mail survey. Half information, half questions. Uh, some of the questions are open-ended, like what, if anything, don't you like about this proposal? And we'll get great feedback from that that, again, helps inform the final item, which is a scientific phone poll, uh, and I'll let Jim just kind of describe a little more detail on that. Yeah, so uh, when Paul says scientific, and the, way, and the reason that the telephone poll differs from the mail poll is a, a mail survey, the people who respond are what we call self-selecting. Get it in the mail, and if you choose to fill it out, then that's who we get, and we have no control over who sends back the mail surveys. With, with a phone survey, we do have control to make sure that we are getting that representative sample. The, example that I use, or the, the simplest way to understand it, is if I just took the first 250, 300 people to, who picked up the phone, the survey would be, oh, about 85% age 65 plus. Uh, older voters are just more likely to take phone surveys. And so what we are able to do, though, is, is control that through what we call age quotas. One of the first questions that we ask on the survey is, in what year were you born? If we've hit what we call our quota for age 65 plus, and someone picks up the phone, they say, I was born in 1944, we say, thank you very much and have a nice day. And so they are left out of the survey because we've already hit that quota. And we do the similar things for you know, different neighborhoods and making sure that we have just the most representative sample possible. And then a couple other things that we're able to do is the most important thing that we do and that I, I really stress to all of my referenda clients, whether they're locals or in a, in a statewide measure, is that we always test as close of an approximation to the ballot measure as possible, what's actually going to be on the ballot. Sometimes people say, hey, this is really legal language. People are going to get confused. Why don't we just simplify it so it's easier for people to understand? And the reason that we don't do that is because we want to simulate what they're going to actually see in the ballot box. So that's something that we've had a lot of success with is making sure that it's as close to what's actually going to appear on the ballot as possible. And then also another thing that we're able to do that you aren't able to do in a mail survey, obviously, is things like randomization and, and rotation. So you're truly not having any influence by question order or or things like that. And uh, yeah, it, it's something that we've had a lot of success with over the year. We take it very, very seriously to get the most accurate results possible. And you know, Paul brought up District 99. The poll that we did in, in June of, no, excuse me, that was in November of 2017, because they were on the ballot in the spring, showed 62%, no, showed 61% support, it passed with 62%. And uh, we've had similar results in 2014, did a poll in New Trier, it showed 64% support, it passed with 64% support. Uh, sometimes it gets a little close, as there's a district uh, south of here, little Sal Peru, where our poll showed 50%, it got about 50.4%. That was, that was a very unique instance where we really had to pare down the measure to something that, that would pass, but we're, we're really pleased with the, with the accuracy of our results over the years and, and think that our, our record speaks for itself. The other nice thing with a uh, scientific poem poll is that you can split the sample, so we can test kind of uh, plan A and we can test a plan B, so that, and that happened again with District 99, testing those two samples. They were almost identical, one was 64% uh, support, one was 61. They decided to, uh, to stay with the larger measure. So uh, anyways, you bring back all this great data. So you have these community meetings, 
feedback from that. You have a mail survey, feedback from that. You have a phone poll, uh, feedback from all your taxpayers. We bring that all back to the citizen task force and, and then they vet it and they say, okay, well, here's our, here are our final recommendations and they, we help them think through you know, what they want to present. And, um, and then they present to the board. And obviously the buck stops here in terms of go or no go. Um, and oftentimes it mimics what the citizen task force recommends. Doesn't always, but oftentimes it does mimic that because they've taken the time to, to vet this, you know, the proposal and to look at the mail server results and phone poll results. Um, and then lastly, out of respect to the taxpayer, you typically do a follow-up mailer to um, all the registered voter households, uh, just sharing what the, you know, thanking them for participating in the mail survey, et cetera. Um, and then finally, it's, it's, again, buck stops here. You have to make the decision, go, no go. Is it something different than what you, what you originally thought? And sometimes it is. The bottom line is that um, my goal is to figure out what the taxpayer wants. My goal is to involve the taxpayer in the planning process. It is not to win, okay? That's what, that's what people are like, oh, well, yeah, come on, give me a break. You're here to pass a tax. No, I'm not. I'm here to respect the taxpayer and to build long-term trust with taxpayers. That's what I do. And it's been extremely successful. So uh, when, I, when I was going through our list of Illinois clients and kind of on the plane marking percentage wins, it wasn't like other than LaSalle, Peru, a 50.5%. These are 63, 65, 70, 74, 76%. These aren't tiny wins, these are big wins. And they happen because we respect the taxpayer. We involve them in the planning process early on and throughout the entire process. And in the end, we're hoping that the board listens to what the taxpayer says. Sometimes boards don't, and that's usually when they lose, when these tax measures go down in flames is when we'll present Hey, you better. You, you might want to consider reducing this. Here's what we're. Here's what we think is the tax threshold. And when, and when certain clients have have listened to that and or have not listened to that and then either kept it the same or supersized it, it usually goes down in flames. Doesn't it? Doesn't benefit anybody. And when it loses, it's very difficult to pass the next one. And if you lose again, even more difficult. The most we ever seen was uh, seven losses from from a. Uh, a school district in California that finally came to us and we won on the eighth time after they, after they had hired us to kind of go through this process. Um, there are times when we will say to a client, do not put this on the ballot. You're not going to win, no matter what it is. And that almost happened with, with LaSalle, Peru. Um, it happened with uh, Frankfurt Park District is my, one of my most recent examples. And a while ago it happened with West Chicago Park District. Yet West Chicago Park District said, we don't care, we're gonna put it on the ballot, <laughs> and it lost. And so um, know that um, I'm not afraid to tell you the truth in terms of whether you have a chance or not, and if you don't have a chance, it is what it is. I'm gonna tell you the truth every time because it doesn't help me because I wanna help. We get to that phase four, all this one through three we charge for. Phase four is pro bono. So if this, this future committee would like our help, we're happy to help. If they don't want our help, that's fine too. Um, but know that if they do want our help, we take it very seriously. And so why would we want to be involved with a campaign that is teed up for, for failure in terms of what that ask is going to be? That's why it's so important for once we get through this process and it comes to the board, I want to make sure that you're voting on something that you truly believe that voters will support. Um, what else? The, uh, I always do my homework in terms of kind of looking through board minutes and figuring out, you know, what were your concerns, right? Um, and, you know, the big concern, I guess, was is there a conflict of interest? And so what happened was that I worked for the same firm for 27 years doing what I do. And they uh, finally, after 20, or after 90 some years, they, they sold to a different firm. So Stiefel Financial purchased George K. Baum and Company. George K. Baum was my employer. And they provided me an offer that I did not accept. And at the same time, White and Company came to me and said, we have a better offer than what they, they can offer. And the reason they offered me that was that, because I've worked with them forever in terms of Nutrier and Maine 207 and District 99, all sorts of down, uh, um, Glenview Park District and others. And they knew that it would be, they felt a very good fit in terms of my involvement with them. So uh, I took that offer. And so now the question is, you know, 
is it a conflict of interest that you work for the architect? And I don't think it is. I think that we're all on the same page. We want to respect your taxpayer. We want to build long-term trust. We only want to put something on the ballot if it has a chance of passing. And if it doesn't, I don't want to be involved with it. Um, I get hired to win. And I win because I respect the taxpayer. And that's why I feel it's not a, it's not a conflict of interest. I think it's awkward that all of a sudden I shifted companies after 27 years. That was the awkward part. But I hope that you truly believe that I'm, I'm, I am committed to your taxpayer as much as I am to the public entity. Um, it's, it's what my mission has been for 27 years, uh, truly being a voice for the taxpayer. Um, as far as one of the other questions was, well, why can't, you know, does this Unicom Art Company and this, whatever this other company is, do they provide the same stuff that, Jer or that Paul Hanley does when he was with George K. Baum? And so I wrote down my list on the plane. So I think we work harder. We have a superior end product. We have a deeper bench. We have Marsha here, not, not in St. Louis, but here. Um, we understand public education. We, li we live and breathe this stuff um, day in and day out. 70% of my clients are, are uh, school districts. Um, we're focused on doing the right thing by listening to the taxpayer. Um, we know your electorate. We were here with District 99. We took the, we've taken the time to kind of think through who your electorate is and, and to look at those poll results again and figure out what, what are their hot buttons and what do they like and what don't they like. Um, and we have 30 years of public opinion research when it comes to school districts. So when you start going down the wrong road, I'm gonna tell you you're going down the wrong road. Um, just because we know, having done so much research in this area, that we have a sense of what works and what doesn't. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. I don't think I do, but I won't start. I like your mission about building trust with the, the taxpayers. So if we kind of look at, you know, I think if I look at this 22,000 taxpayers in the district, how would you kind of measure success of building that trust after the votes are counted, like long term? How do you measure success? Yep. So, so in the case of South Peru, success was, um, the reason it was successful at 50.4%, is that it started at 90 million. And I walked into their boardroom and I said, what's the tax impact? And they gave me the amount. I said, not in a million years are you gonna pass a tax of that size in this district. It's just not gonna happen. I don't even need to poll. And so then they said, okay, well, we have a plan B at 65 million. I said, what's the tax impact? And they said, and I said, it's still high, but we can go test it. And so shared the information with the community, tested it. First day of polling, uh, it's pulling awful. And Jim calls, or Jim calls me and says, call the client, this is not gonna pass. And so I said, do you have a plan C? And so they had a $36 million issue. And so Jim switched it over, we tested it, it was at 50 point something percent, and that's what we ended up with. So is that percentage something I like? No, right, I want 60, I want 70% support. I want as high as possible. Uh, we just worked with Huntley Library District, they were at like 76% support, and that's what I want. That's where you know that taxpayer is totally committed to this idea. I don't want 50.5%. Yeah, you win, but it doesn't do you any good for the long term. This is not the first time you're gonna be out here. There might be a, a limiting rate increase or some other need that you have years down the road. I wanna build trust for that as well, not just this one-off. We can win one-offs all the time, um, but it requires kind of scorched earth policy and I don't like doing that. I just wanna respect the taxpayer, figure out what they want, and hopefully in the end, you make decisions that allow us to get a really nice percentage of support. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll ask a question. Um, in all the proposals that we got, one thing that stood out with you, Paul, is that you said that maybe none of these things are a possibility, and that was something markedly different than all the others, because um, they were like, oh, this is what you want? Okay, we'll get, and you were like, well, let's slow our roll, and let's, let's look at it. So where in the process would you, like you were suggesting, maybe we look at boundaries, maybe we look at all those other things. Where would that be in, the, in is that in step one? It's like before even assembling the task force? Uh, so I would assemble it. So it, at first blush, I was thinking the task force would happen after that. But I think the task force should happen early. It should be formed early on so that they can, they can truly have this, it really becomes the community's plan and not the board's plan and not staff's plan. It has to be the community's plan. And so I would have the task force early on 
Um, when with District 99, that, that task force happened a little bit later. Mm -hmm. uh, with this one, I think they have to be right off the bat. We need to assemble, again, business leaders, civic leaders, kind of big time movers and shakers in the community to be involved in this and to have a voice. Okay. It's, it's complicated though. Anytime we're talking about, you know, again, we might want to, you know, Marsha would tell you about as far as kind of thinking through even how you say boundaries and things. We have to think yeah. about how we issue The hair on people's necks stand yeah. up when you we say that. We have some alternative <laughs> Okay, yeah, I was, I'm not a wordsmith. I'm just... Yeah. <laughs> it means the same thing, but it, it sounds a little bit more palatable. And uh -huh. oftentimes, really, if you can answer people's questions about boundary adjustments versus leaving it as a gray area or something you're going to solve later, that just sets their minds at ease and gets them on your team. I think Paul's talked about this a fair bit. One of the big purposes of these meetings is to let people say what they think, and you build trust by listening to what people think and adjusting the plan accordingly. Um, yeah, it's the it's the one thing in this plan that really concerns me. Anytime we talk talk about that, um, so it's scary for uh, parents. It's scary for taxpayers. Um, you know, it's scary for parents because all of a sudden it's just different. It's a new approach. And it's scary for taxpayers because it's not cheap to do this, to, to try to move sixth graders in with the seventh and eighth graders. It's not, you know, it's not a cheap uh, ask. So um, we need to, I think, tread carefully in the beginning because if we don't, I think that that could potentially sink the whole thing in the end. And so we really want to, I think, carefully test that. What do you think about uh, task force makeup? You said you wanted the movers and the shakers. Mm -hmm. I imagine it's opt-in, and so how do you um, how do you ultimately get the right folks to the table? That is, I imagine, also then representative of your voter yeah. voter base. So with the um, so it's again it's that broad cross section of who I who I described. It's geographically in terms of the district. Um, the other thing is this cannot be a rubber stamp of the district. So if this is perceived as just, oh, it's just, this task force is just a rubber stamp of the district, then what good is it? So um, I think that you need people um, who are willing to challenge the district and willing to truly vet the proposal, but not to, not to um, disrupt everything. So would I load it up with all tea partiers? Probably not. Would I sprinkle it with a few? Probably. Because um, I want to know, I truly want to know what this taxpayer thinks. Um, and we want to know that well in advance of putting this on the ballot. And so I think that, and even well in advance of sharing and testing it, that's the beauty of the task force is they can help you vet this and say, you know, no, that's, we don't think that's going to work. Or, yeah, that sounds reasonable. Let's go share and test it. So, um, but I, I definitely have a, a lot of experience kind of thinking through who, who works and who doesn't when it comes to these task forces. But please don't, please don't load it up with just friendlies. That, that just doesn't work. That makes sense. How do you actually get them to the table? Like, why were you so, approaching yeah. these folks to get them to join a significant time commitment? Sure. So, um, so you typically send a. First of all, you start with a key influencer database. So, um, we think about how many you want in your database, um, and then we send a letter out to them to a certain number. Our goal is to get 30, 35 on the task force. Um, sometimes you've had as many as 45, which just seems too big. Um, so, kind of that 30, 35 uh, amount. Um, but it, again, it's typically head of the Chamber of Commerce, it's the main realtor in town, it's a, a local lawyer, it's the commercial banker, it's a, uh, it's a faith-based leader, it's people that truly have a voice and they all kind of have their own posse and they bring that. It's also, it's also um, sometimes it's um, community, community uh, college folks, it's, there's a lot of different voices in the community and it's, we, it's a really powerful, you've been through it, it's yeah. a really powerful um, approach that and it really works. I mean, there's some rough times during some of the meetings, um, but in the end, um, even those who we thought were going to be super against it, oftentimes will be in support of it because they finally someone listened to what they thought. It's really powerful, and then they become your super advocates, typically. Um, what's your split of experience between 912 and K8? What is my experience of yeah? So how, uh, how in at least in the like Illinois area, how often have you worked with 912 versus K8 um, district? Worked with a number of 912s. Um, I, you know, I also do a lot of work in Colorado where it, where it's not broken out. It's large. Like I work with like Saint Brain schools. They have thirty thousand students. 
Um, so I work with, you know, I've worked with um, uh, urban and rural and, and kind of suburbia and all over the place. But I, I do have experience with it. Marsha definitely has experience right, with it. Right, so I've worked with many school districts from um, Downers Grove all the way up to Vernon Hills. And it's been, I'd say, probably a mix, 50-50 uh, of K-8 and high schools and some community unit districts. So um, um, I was actually a communication director in a K-8 district, so I'm really familiar with the way that you work, the roles of people, and um, areas where you might need some support, because as we all know, everyone who works on a board or in a school district is already stretched pretty thin. Uh, one that comes to mind recently is Northbrook Glenview, um, 30. Uh, and in fact, uh, two weeks ago, I toured a new middle school, which was nice to finally go back to the project that was funded. Um, we're currently working with uh, uh, District 34 as well, uh, again, through this, this exact same process. So right now, I am in the middle of looking at their mail survey. I'm kind of fine-tuning their mail survey and getting ready to send that out. That's where they are in their process. They're looking at a, they're looking at a, a spring election. Right, and their task force started meeting last summer. Right. Their first meeting was last July. I have a spout, I, because you mentioned the how long ago that task force started for November 2020. Do we, what does the timeline look like for us to be? We're, it already feels aggressive, given that it's a year away. Um, so yeah, help me understand what yep. help me understand what level of discomfort or comfort you have in um, knowing that that timeline is tight. Yeah. So I have my dates here somewhere. So. Um, I'm comfortable, the only thing that doesn't make me comfortable is that beginning part where we have to test this 6-8 concept right away. And so it's going to be kind of, we have to kind of do it quickly if we're going to do that. Um, and, and then we have to figure out, does the board truly want to use this process where that we allow a citizen task force to make certain decisions, like what to share and test, or do you want, those, do you want that decision to end with the board? So that's a really big, important decision if you want to use our process, whether you do that or not. You can do it both ways, but um, you know it's going to make a difference. So in, to, in terms of ownership of the plan. Um, so yeah, we can, we can get through this process. Again, I only think the, the sticking point is that testing the 6-8 concept right away, let's hope that it doesn't, nothing weird happens in terms of you know, kind of postponing other things. Jim wants some time between that first benchmark survey, that phone poll, and that second one, because if we try to get it too close, then we're not going to get enough completed calls. And so we need, you know, we kind of like two and a half months between first and second to make this work right. First and second meeting, you mean? Like the task force meeting? Oh, uh, no. So first and second poll. So, so, poll. The, okay. yeah. Yeah. so if, there, if, it's, if it's sooner than that, then all of a sudden we're just not going to get people responding and you don't, you'll have a fewer number of completed calls and a higher margin of error. So, but to answer your question, I think more directly, completing this work in a year is very doable. And it ends in August, though, remember. So, as far as, right. you know, you yeah, know right. it's, it's not really all the way through November. Right. That's, the, that's the campaign. So, you know, August, you have to make that, you have the board has to, you know, adopt the ballot question if they, if they proceed. What does your communication with White and Company look like through this process? Um, so, so, Brad, uh, uh, Paulson uh, said, "Okay, you're going tonight. We'll see. So, what's you know, kind of what's your discussion?" And, and I just told him, and he said, "He said, you don't even know who the project manager is." I said, "No, from White, right?" And um, which I don't, and I've never met this person, so I'm I'm new to White, and um, I think they will add tremendous value, which they always do. Um, but I don't. I'm still kind of learning the company. I don't. I'm, I'm two weeks into this, and so I'm doing what I've always done uh, with my team. Um, and they have their team, and so you know I, they can definitely get me up to speed as far as the homework that's been done. Um, but that's that's kind of where we stand right now. There's typically a lot of dialogue between this team and any architect. Definitely, or construction manager. Uh, because we have to understand manager. the plans, and sometimes it's a question of translating what we learn from the surveys, from the community meetings, from the 
qualitative feedback to help them refine their plans. So there's always an ongoing dialogue. Can you imagine that dialogue being similar as it was when you worked on 99? Well, it would be, yeah, I mean, it would be the same thing. We're just trying to, what, where they bring value is um, helping to find cost, helping to find solutions in terms of facilities, and then what I call the sizzle. So voters barely read anymore, right? It's about pictures and pretty illustrations and, and infographics and all these other things, and that's where, that's where architects add tremendous value, is that what's the sizzle? Um, they're also involved in, if we do a video, informational video, they can provide all sorts of stuff. So um, that's how I typically work with them. Um, can you speak a little bit, I guess, I guess I tend to look towards the, the cynical side of, mm -hmm. of things, and I sure. think um, we kind of know and understand that we're going to have one shot at this, and it's going to be challenging, especially given 99 just passed referendum, and as I'm sure you know, going through that process, there are going to be people in the community who are going to rally against, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and I think some of that feeling is amping up in, in, in the community lately in terms of divisiveness perhaps over other issues going on in the moment. Um, and I think there's going to be, people are going to be looking for a reason or looking for excuses to say, don't vote for this. Um, so I guess my biggest concern um, from kind of the conflict of interest perspective, I, I don't know that any of us necessarily feel that there actually would be a conflict of interest, but there will be a perceived, there could be their perception that perhaps some people will see you know, that is, a, is problematic and use that against what we're trying to achieve. So how would you address that in terms of your whole, the plan in general, um, different than you might from other challenges that people try to get people against sure. the proposal? You know what I mean? Like yeah. this is going to be a whole separate little like piece of the puzzle. So how would you address yeah, that specifically? I would, I would always stress that, um, a lot of the work that I do is qualitative research, and where rubber hits the road is the scientific research, and that's what Jim does. So Jim's totally independent from, from White & Company, from Beyond Your Base, mm -hmm. from Marsha. Uh, this is the same polling firm that does the Wall Street Journal poll. Um, you know, this guy's on CNN and, and CNBC and, uh, you know. And you guys uh, see you PBS and <laughs> <laughs> So you're getting the real deal here, right? And so this, he's not gonna, He's not going to kind of fudge the data to make it look good. We're trying, nor would I. We're trying to, we're trying to make sure that the proposal that's on that ballot truly is supported by the taxpayer. And I think that the answer to it is when somebody says, "Well, these, you know, these folks," you say, "Yeah, but this is what we're doing. They, they're asking us to put a citizen task force together. They're asking us to do all these community meetings. They're asking us to do a mail survey, a phone call, uh, online uh, survey after community meeting." All this stuff, they're not working against the taxpayer, they're working for the taxpayer to figure out what you want. That's why, that's why we brought them on. And I think also one thing that, that both Paul and Marcia do a really good job with, and this is something that we, we test in the surveys, as we always ask the question, and it always tests off the charts, is we try to be as transparent as possible throughout this process. I mean, there's going to be plenty of meetings, it's, everything's going to be very, very well publicized, and so I, I think that really helps people too, that look, this isn't, uh, you know, something being decided in smoke-filled rooms. This is something that the entire community can be as engaged with as, as they would like to be, and, and people are going to be encouraged to provide feedback, whether it's through the mail survey, obviously the phone survey, at the various community meetings, being invited to be on the task force, and I, and I think that's really helpful as well. They're, they're always looking for a reason to vote no. Mm -hmm. They always are, so no matter what it is. And there's never a good time to put a tax on the ballot, never. Something always happens. Mm -hmm. And so um, the, the good thing is that when you, when you jump through all these hoops and we finally do the phone poll at the end, you're going to have a better sense of whether you have a chance or not. And those poll results might come back where it says, you don't have a chance. Even if, you do a, even if you do a downsized measure, you might not have a chance. And so you might have to postpone it. I mean, that's the reality. So again, I, I think you're right. They do look for a reason to vote no. I, I would never poo-poo that. They, they do all the time. So what we're trying to do, though, is figure out how to involve them in the planning process. 
how to make sure that we capture their voice. Hey, Jill, I just want to make sure that we're not uh, leaving you out. I know you're here in robot nope. form. <laughs> good. All good, thank you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I think, uh, I think something that's important to know, and I know you've done a lot of research, so you probably um, have an understanding of that, is this came about through quite an organic process in the fact that as we were wrapping up, it was a very different type of strategic plan that focused a lot on SEL and, 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 and those kind of things. We moved into this uh, process and we started connecting with the community. This is where a lot of these issues really rose from, from our community at large. You know, they, um, they liked the neighborhood schools, but but they didn't like the pressure that it had on the buildings. They kind of, uh, our, our curriculum was seeming to align more with seventh and eighth grade, and they were looking at some of the other communities, and they liked the idea of maybe, maybe moving uh, sixth through eight. Uh, then we did, then from that, we sort of built a strategic plan out of that, and we started working, or, you know, with, with the team here saying, is sixth through eighth grade a good idea for us? And if it wasn't, then, then let's not worry about it. So I think that ultimately, and I think this is where some people worry about conflict of interest, but, um, but just in general, I think that we need to be willing to go out to the community and go, all right, we talked to you about what you wanted and we listened. And it cost a lot of money. Everything sounds awesome when it doesn't cost you any money, but now that there's a dollar amount to this, now how do you feel about it? Are we on this track, are we on that track? And I think we have to be open-minded. And if that means we don't hit a deadline date, then and we need to rethink our approach and really connect and work with our community, we have to be willing to do that. Right. If it means that no measure is possible and we need to just figure out how to, uh, you know, how to go back to the drawing board and, and, and work uh, you know, within our tight constraints of our budget, we've got to be willing to take that. Or do we have a community that can get behind what a lot of people see as the vision of where they want to see District 58? And if that is, to what extent is that? I think that we have to come in and we are. I mean, I, I, this was not a board initiative. This is not something that, that we cooked up. A lot of this process started before any of us was, was on the board um, at all. So it, it, is a, it is a matter of this engagement part is really, really important beyond just um, trying to win, but really trying to make sure that, that we are connected because um, I have no interest in writing a larger property tax bill either. Um, so, you know, you know I, if, if we're going to do this, I, you know, like, to me, it's got to be something that I personally believe in that I'm going, yeah, I'm going to vote. I'm going to vote yes because, in general, not only is it going to help my, my kids, it's going to help the community at large beyond people that have, have kids in the district. So um, it's, about, it's about educating us as much as it is about learning so that we can, we can properly word things and get on the ballot. So I think that that's something that's really important to us and make sure that that, that is our focus, not not on how do we get something built, but, um, and I think that was some of the questions that, all right, when you're working that closely with the architect, I don't want to focus on what we're building. I want to focus on what our community yeah, needs. Yeah, so there's, a, there's yeah. a what. We focus on the why. Yeah. Right? They're all about the what. And I, I kind of care about the what, but I really care about the why, because that's what the taxpayer cares about. Yeah. So I think ultimately what we're really looking for is somebody that is willing to come and be frank with us and say, all right. Yeah, your community felt one way when you were engaging them on a strategic plan. Air conditioning was incredibly important. Now, you know, now, the, you know, now it's less so when, when we actually have a, a, a price tag that goes along with that. So um, I'm looking for somebody that's going to sit down and talk with us and go, all right, wait a minute, Let, let's rethink our, our strategy here. And if that doesn't mean, you know, originally our original date was to try to be on the, um, on the primary ballot. Right. And we quickly realize there's no reason for us to try to scramble and try to pull something off just to get something done. It's about doing what's right. So we, that's what we're, I think we're looking yeah, for. And I think that's uh, really the point of the mail pieces and the community engagement meetings that we do. So we'll do a deep dive with you and understand the educational justification, especially for shifting the sixth graders so that we can take that back to the community. Why is it good for sixth graders? And, uh, how does it help at the, what becomes the K through five building? So we will need to learn part of that from you, sure. and then we'll work with you also to explain it in terms that um, not just educators use, but people use at the soccer field and at Starbucks. 
when they're talking to each other. Yeah, because our goal is to make sure that we really understand what, what people are looking for. This is not this is not a phase to get mm -hmm. to we're not doing steps one through three just to get to four. Right. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to find out if we need four and exactly what four would look like. I think we're still, we want to make sure that we have that right, that right piece. So th this part is, re those first phases are incredibly important um, for us because I think, they, like you said, we have to pull, you know, we have to kind of pull that again, that six through eight, um, to make sure that that's still the direction that, right, that the people are looking for. Right, community's priority and not just parent priorities. And we got to tie it in right, and tying that back with the, the work that these folks did in making sure that it actually makes sense uh, for our district. All right, we heard from you. Now we did some research. We worked with the, the, the teachers and their union and, and, and figured out is, is this a good plan? And now, now coming back to you, do we still feel the same way? So um, I think that's going to be our, our challenge in moving forward. For sure. Paul, one just quick question that I had as we were going through our various options, and you know, one of the things that you said earlier that resonated was, you know, you have to know what what would likely pass. Should we make a plan A, plan B, plan sure. C? How do we go about that process in determining what is that dollar amount or impact to the average taxpayer? Um, you know, is it a hundred dollars more a year? Is it two hundred? Is it specific around the types of question you're asking? You know, if it's pure facility needs, mm -hmm. maintenance. Are voters willing to pay more if it's, um, you know, 21st century learning spaces? Are are they willing to pay less? Um, how do we, as, as we're starting to filter that as a as an organization, determine kind of that sweet spot? Because right now I can tell you, and I, I don't have your background, but the number that's out there is a pretty big number. And, and knowing that that has to get filtered down, are, are right. you getting yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. So I saw the number, and I told you when I saw that number, Correct. I said that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. right? um, because you know, there's no way this community is going to support that. Um, and you said, we know that. This is just tr truly all of our needs, right? Um, and, you know, in my head I had a number, but I wouldn't say it now. Mm -hmm. um, so, as I mentioned to you, that voters want to protect what they already own, right? They own these. These are, these are not your facilities, right? These are their facilities. They own them. They're taxpayers. Um, and they want to protect them, especially that senior voter. They want to protect what they already own. And so there's a part in here that's about that. I think at a minimum that would that would receive support. Um, tax uh, taxpayers want to make sure that kids are safe and teachers are safe. And so any components with regard to health, safety, security, I think would be overwhelmingly supported. Um, but then when we move into kind of these, uh, how would I say it? New uh, tangle. New Classrooms. How would, a, how, would a, how would an older voter describe a kind of? They don't quite understand yet. What, what does that mean, right? Does it mean there's computers in it? What, what does that mean? What is a? What's a learning? Why do you commons? need? What, yeah. What's yeah. a learning commons? That kind of yeah. commons. That was yeah. a, we we couldn't go down that avenue because even though there was a learning condom, commons, um, it just wasn't understood, and it was we weren't going to spend eighty percent of our time trying to explain it, um, and then. So anyway, some of these issues, I think, right, they're just going to, and I, the other thing is, I don't think you should surpass your bonding capacity, right? I mean, you can, but then you have to have the legislature approve that, and then that becomes a whole completely separate issue. So I think, you know, that's kind of always my starting point. We've done it before, um, but I don't like to do it. I think that you have to live within your means and stay, with, stay below your bonding capacity. So the question is, can you, is there a way to kind of maybe, if you wanted to do move the sixth graders, is there a way to scale back some of the other stuff so that you can be below your body capacity and still deliver on this 6-8 promise? Um, but it's a, it's a tough decision. It's, you know, the easy, the easy thing is to say, oh, let's just do the, let's just kind of fix up the stuff and do some of the safety and security stuff and I'm going to go home. That's easy, right? We do that right now. But that's not what this, that's not why you, you were decided to run for the board. You're here to make tough decisions, right? And so the good news is through this process, we're gonna know if you have a chance or not of adding layering on some of that other stuff that might take your schools from great to really great. So thank you. Yep. Let's see if this question's coming. 
Thank you so much for your time. We greatly appreciate you. Thank you. Appreciate being it. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, the long oh, way. No, it's you all. Thank you no so much. much. Yeah, we'll take five minutes. We'll come back here at a uh, quarter, a quarter till, uh, quarter till nine. Sure. I am Jennifer Holt with Unicom ARC. And Rod Wright with Unicom ARC. And, and you can tell right from the beginning, 20 years we haven't decided whether it's ARC or ARC. So. <laughs> I usually go with art, so I appreciate that. Well, <laughs> you and me. <laughs> okay. okay, so thank you for having us here tonight. We're excited to talk a little bit about our process and um, talk through what we've done for some similar school districts and answer any questions that you might have regarding community engagement and the approach that we take. So we have been in business for close to 50 years, which is a long time, especially these days when you look at different corporations around the uh, country. We really helped pioneer community engagement in school districts um, in the late 90s um, and looked into how we could help school districts and bring their communities together to help make decisions um, and build better futures. One of the keys to what we do is that we really have an integrated approach that's customized for every district that we work in. And what we bring with us is the experience of implementing these in a lot of different districts and learning what works and what doesn't work and then finding a system that will work for your particular community. Um, did you want to add anything to the history piece? Well, I, Jennifer said that we were kind of pioneers in, in putting this together when we started in really the early 90s to begin putting these programs together. There were no best practices. We were working with uh, one of the largest architectural firms in the country and we were literally making it up as we went. And, and by the late 90s, when the uh, public agenda group was showcasing best practices and community engagement, uh, when they came to do a presentation in the Midwest, four or five of the, of the case studies they showed were ours. So we've really kind of made it up as we've gone, made a ton of mistakes. A little later, we're going to talk about best practices, but those best practices have all come from us messing it up at some point in time, kind of figuring out that we made a mistake and how to, how to fix it and then hopefully not making that mistake again. So we kind of learned, learned the hard way. Uh, we actually turned 50 next year, which is something we're pretty proud of. We're gonna have our 50th anniversary next year. So, oh, and I wanted to mention Jenna Engler, who's on our staff and lives here in Chicago, couldn't be with us tonight. We wanted Jenna to join us, but she's uh, at a meeting in the Gulf Elementary District uh, at what's called a facilitating team meeting. We'll talk about what that means a little bit later. Um, one of the things that we'll talk a lot about tonight is our integrated approach, which involves research, communications, and community engagement. And so we feel pretty passionately that those three pillars help build a successful program. So why are we doing engagement? Um, the way that we look at it is that it really is to bring your community together to learn about the challenges and opportunities facing your district, and then working together to develop the best solutions for your community. And that looks a little different everywhere that we work. What we're learning is that increasingly, people want to be asked. They want to be invited. They want to be involved in the discussion. A lot of times we'll talk to people and they'll ask about social media. Everything is digital. We'll just send things. People are really looking for that chance to connect with their neighbors and to connect with other parents at their school and really have that face-to-face -face interaction. Um, and our process works well for tying in that digital piece along with that face-to-face -face interaction. One of the books that had a lot of influence on how we think through this, I don't know if you're familiar with it, there's a very interesting book called Applebee's America that has nothing to do with Applebee's other than a chapter, but the business model at Applebee's when it first started and it was a huge success was just what Jennifer said. People were longing for community and they wanted to go someplace where they saw their neighbors and Applebee's built on that model. And uh, along with these mega churches and a number of other organizations that, 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 that sense that need for community. And I'm always amazed even still that when people come to our community engagement uh, uh, meetings, 
they want to hang around after the meeting and keep talking to one another. It's like they're missing that in their lives and this becomes an outlet for that kind of activity. So we want to make sure we build into our work the opportunity for people to work together a lot. And, and we'll talk about that a little bit later too. And with that is there's wisdom in crowds. When you bring a group together, a lot of really good ideas bubble up to the top and our process helps bring those good ideas to the top and really come up with creative solutions to the challenges you're facing. Yeah, and that's another great book too, by the way, Wisdom in Crowds. <laughs> um, we like to look at two different ways that we tend to get input to learn what your community is thinking. And a piece of that is the active participation, which many people think of as the traditional community engagement forums, um, and then scientific public opinion research. And that gives us the really good hard data and the hard numbers that we sometimes need to make good decisions. And it's important to do both. I mean, usually there's an overlap. Usually the opinion research and the active participation lead you the same direction. Uh, some years ago, we were doing work in Naperville, and we didn't do the community engagement work, but we, we were doing survey work. About 75% of the input they got at their community engagement meetings was tear down a high school and build a new one. About 75% of the survey respondents said renovate the old building. And, and, and the solution that your architects did, by the way, White & Company, was a renovation solution where they renovated the building and it was kind of functionally equivalent to new construction. When you walk through it, it looked brand new. But, but the difference was saying that we're renovating was a, a, a proposal that could pass at the polls, tearing down and building new probably would have lost. Uh, and the outcome, at least for the community, from my view, was the same. So there was kind of a disconnect between the survey, between everybody and the people that showed up at the meetings. And the, needless to say, the board had a difficult decision to make, given that data, but I think made the right decision. At least it got to our high school. So why exactly does this process work? Um, we are seeing that the public permission is really needed for meaningful change. So as many great ideas can happen in a small room, you really need that public permission and that public understanding in order for things to actually change and to create a seismic shift. Um, it's really a powerful communication tool. With our program, there is a lot of communications that happen. So even if people aren't attending a community engagement session, they're going to know that that's, this process is happening and that they have the opportunity to provide feedback and be part of the decision-making process. Um, it also helps build an army for implementation. So anything that you need to be doing in the future, you're building a great database of supportive people in your community that want to come out and help your schools. Another thing is that we, a lot of times, look at our process similar to a class, where we really want the community to discover the challenges that you're facing. Um, I'll let Rod, he's got a good story that goes along a little bit with yeah, this. Yeah, and I wanted to, it just popped into my head on the previous slide. Uh, Public won't support what it doesn't understand. A lot of times when people vote no, it's not because they're opposed to public education. There's a few of those. And, and, and it, it, more often it's not that they're opposed to what you're trying to do for kids. It's that they just didn't get it. They didn't understand it. Uh, we did a lot of work in Paxton, Buckley, Loda, one of my favorite school districts, PBL. And, and they, one of the challenges they had with the community was getting the community to understand with Illinois law and health life safety requirements, there was no free solution. You know, that they were either going to spend money fixing up crappy old buildings or they were going to have a comprehensive facility improvement plan that may cost more now, but that would save the district a lot of money down the road. And when we got the community thinking about not what they were going to spend within the first two years, but what they were going to spend over a 30, 40 year period, support for a proposal in that very conservative community increased a lot. The superintendent kept saying that we only got one shot to do this and if we blow it, we won't pass things for 50 years. Part of passing it was getting the community to not think about tomorrow or a year from now, but to think 20 or 30 years down the road. And not only what it meant in terms of spending tax dollars, but what it meant for kids who could go to school in, in new facilities that, that would house kind of best practices in today's education. And, and that's kind of how, how they got to that point. Uh, that middle point, discovery is more powerful than persuasion. Everybody on our st my staff hates me talking about this, but I'm gonna do it anyhow. Uh, we used to have a teacher, a picture, a real picture of my uh, 
geometry teacher from high school. I had 39 people in my uh, high school graduating class. Her name was Mary Soderman, but everybody hated it so much we traded it out. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer did it without even telling me, of course. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, she walks into when we're taking geometry and says, listen, I'm a social studies teacher. I'm not a math teacher. I guess the district couldn't hire a math teacher. So we're just going to have to do the best we can. And there was like maybe 10 of us in the class. And so every day she'd come in and we'd read the book. Uh, there would be activities or exercises at the end of each chapter and we'd get in small groups and work on those at the chalkboard, this was ages ago, and, and, and figure it out. And after we figured out the geometry problems, we would show her uh, how it all worked. And by the end of the year, she was pretty good at geometry and so were we. And, and so I'm some years later off to college and doing, I'm kind of a math geek and doing pretty well on math. And it dawned on me, she was the best teacher I ever had. And she knew geometry, but she knew that if she gave us information, if she asked some really, really smart questions, put us in small groups and let us figure it out and then show her how it worked, we would remember it forever. And that's kind of the philosophy we use in our community engagement programs. If you don't get anything else tonight, that's kind of the message we're giving. You bring people in, you want to hear from them, but you got stuff you want to tell them. You give them data and information. You put them in small groups and you let them work on that together collaboratively in a small community, solving problems. And they figure out stuff and they go over a series of meetings exactly what is in the best interest of the district. And we've seen it happen over and over and over because if they discover it on their own, rather than us trying to tell them, it, it, it sticks and it'll last forever. And that's kind of our philosophy overall about doing community engagement, no matter what the actual activities look like. It's a matter of discovery and kind of rolling up your sleeves and working as community members. And so we like to spend a little bit of time talking about that. That's actually most, that's what, 95% of what we know. I'm joking, but. So tying into that is the actual, a couple different community engagement models that we use to help facilitate this discovery process, as we would call it. Many times we will start this off with a charge from the board. And what this does is really provide some direction and some goals for what answers you're looking for from the community. It also helps keep everybody on task a little bit because there are so many different things that people like to discuss regarding their schools. This really keeps things focused. The next step is to put together a community-led facilitating team. This is typically 15 to 20 people in your community and not those usual suspects that you find in a blue ribbon committee or your key communicator group. We're really looking for those new faces. Um, how can we bring together some diverse opinions uh, and kind of fill the room with lots of different minds? The goal of this group is to actually put together what they think is maybe the best model to use here in the community with our guidance. Um, and so what this group will do is decide, do we want to have large community meetings? Should we be doing open houses? What's the best way to get input from as many people as we can throughout our entire district? We, a lot of times with this model, will break this group into a communications committee, an outreach committee, and a canvassing, which is a door-to-door -door committee to help spread the word about the community engagement effort. We'll gather community input through meetings, um, digital, direct mail, things like that. That facilitating team will then draft and put together recommendations for the board. And then the board actually takes action on that plan. So this is a little bit of a streamlined process. And it's up to the board whether it wants recommendations or a report. And that's an important difference because if the group comes in with recommendations and it gives the board heartburn and the recommendations aren't accepted, that disconnect is a serious problem to say the least. So, so it's important in the board charge to, to say what you want at the end. The other thing I wanted to add is you may have been familiar with the work that was done in the Glen Allen Elementary District prior to their rate increase. This is roughly the model that we used in Glen Allen, and we're going to show some of the communication materials that, that, that came with that. Uh, this, this way of doing things, and there can be a lot of varieties, and it can be done in a much shorter period of time than the next slide that Jennifer's going to show you. 
So this chart is actually a little bit of a better representation for what we typically do with districts who have time for a formal community engagement program. So again, it starts with the charge up on the top left um, and moves down through with your facilitating team. Community engagement sessions are very large sessions that anybody who wants to come can come and learn about the topic for the evening. And that might be operations, facilities, technology, staffing. What are those different needs that your district has? And at each of those community engagement sessions, we'll cover one of those topics and gather feedback from the community. Once we have all of that information together, the facilitating team will work together to develop those options. We'll take those back to the community engagement participants and work on getting those refined, getting them where they need to be, and then bringing the recommendations or the report to the board. Yeah, I mentioned Paxton Buckley Lode, and this is more representative of what we did there. The board chart specifically said they wanted a, a, a facility improvement master plan. The charge also specifically said, in a nice way, we don't want you mucking around with how we educate kids in terms of curriculum and instruction. What it did say was we've spent a lot of time putting a strategic plan together about curriculum and instruction. We know what we're trying to do in the classroom. We want you to help us build a facility plan that will better house or will enhance what we're trying to do educationally rather than impair what we're trying to do educationally. And a lot of the success, again, in, in, in PBL was having the staff, the teachers, talk about how the current facilities impaired what they were trying to do in the classroom, again, rather than, well, I said that word earlier, rather than enhance what they were trying to do. So over a series of, I don't know, five or six, seven meetings, the community actually reached consensus on a facility master plan for the, for the district that, that, that sent a uh, proposal to the ballot box at the end of the program. That was one of the recommendations that they made. This is also the model that Huntley 158 is currently using. Their charge was specifically for a strategic plan. So theirs, I kind of remember, but I think their charge even says we are not looking at facilities, we are not looking at finance, this is only a strategic plan. Um, and so that actually is helping set their course of study for their engagement program right, right and, now. And we're not writing the actual action plan through the engagement model. The report to the board at the end is going to be on priorities and goal statements. And then uh, Scott Cuffle, a retired superintendent that was in Geneseo for quite a while that works with us on projects, Scott's going to go in with his team and actually drive the action plan or the strategic plan on the action steps and by when and by whom and how you measure success and, and that piece of it. But those are going to be constrained, if you will, by the priorities and goals that come out of the uh, engagement program. It's, a, it's similar to work that we did in High School District 211 where we also build an action plan for that district using that kind of model. So no matter what model we use, there's three key pieces that we want to come out of all of our processes. First of all, it has to involve a large number of people. So we want to involve as many people as we can here in the district. We need people to have the chance to have a meaningful discussion and a meaningful dialogue, come to consensus, come to agreement, figure out what we as a community are thinking and feeling. Um, and we need to have really good ongoing two-way communication. So we want to make sure that we're providing information and that we're hearing and we're listening. Um, another kind of thing when we're looking at best practices is we want to make sure that we have internal acceptance and internal support. So it's a lot of work for you, yes. in other words. So you got to be ready to do it. We'll work hard. You're going to have to work hard, too. Uh, Exactly that. And then on top of that, we have the clear charge that we talked about. Citizen leadership is huge. And so a lot of times at the beginning of the process, we have some hesitant, reluctant community volunteers who have said, okay, I'll share this process. Not sure what I'm getting myself into. By the end of the process, they are really community leaders. Um, and it's really a great, a great way to cultivate some new relationships here in the community. Um, it's an open process with that two-way communication we've talked about. We make sure that you have a comprehensive timeline and a syllabus. Everything is very professionally run, very much to timelines, deadlines. It's a very organized process. And we always make sure that we have data and information driving every decision that we're making. And again, with PBL, that meant when we were looking at various options, we wanted to make sure people could do kind of an apples to apples, 30 year out comparison of the various options they were looking at. And, and that was a key part of that. 
So as I mentioned, part of this is making sure that we have well-planned, organized meetings and events. We make sure and we rehearse every single presentation before it goes out to the community. If we're doing open houses, we'll actually run all of those materials and all of those presentations by the facilitating team before it goes out to the public. Um, we really want to make sure that all of those workshops and open houses go on without a hitch. Um, all of them will involve work activities, as Rod talked about, and um, different one-on-one -on -one activities to gather all of that different feedback. You'll, you'll find when, when we do this, the community meetings are actually the easy part. The, the hard part is the facilitating team meetings where we debate and discuss and we rehearse and make sure nothing goes wrong because if you have 300 people in the room and you have a bad meeting, you'll have 50 at the next meeting. Uh, but, but we've got that down pat. Those facilitating team meetings are really exciting and the discussion is always good. We encourage people to be devil's advocates. We had a meeting one night where a member of the facilitating team came up to us at the end of the meeting and said, you know, we must have had a bad meeting tonight because my head doesn't hurt. But it kind of hurt Joe, but it was kind of the point to, to how the process works. Um, we always want to make sure that everything is very well documented. And this goes back to having our data and our information and everything clearly set forth. So when we do an open house or we do a community engagement session, we want to make sure that that's well documented and then well published through your website or however you decide to get that information out to the community. So a lot of times the first step will be that topical presentation, whatever that may be, and then your work activity. We do a document called the verbatim responses, which is the consensus that each group came to written down on one sheet. Um, the summary of that is actually the executive summary and then with that are the consensus points. So every session that you have, you'll come out with a set of seven or eight, here's what everybody agreed on at this big community engagement session. Then those are really the driving force for your recommendations or your report at the end. And Rod's gonna talk a little bit about the communications we, piece. We are first and foremost a communications firm uh, that, that does planning and work with school districts, but I wanna emphasize the communications piece. That's what drives, that's the discipline that drives us. Uh, and the reason I want to mean that, you can put on a heck of a good show doing community engagement, but if you're not doing the communications that go with that, you're not getting the full benefit of it. You know, we're getting nice attendance in Huntley. There are tens of thousands of people that aren't coming to the meetings, but the communications people, that piece of that is critically important. And, and, and there are a lot of people in education that can do planning for you. I think what distinguishes us from everybody else is, is that we're communicators uh, by nature. I have a PhD in political science. My background is in public opinion research. Everything I know about communications I've learned in the last 30 plus years working at Unicom where that discipline exists on theme and message and repetitive communications and kind of keeping up to date on what works in terms of strategies. Uh, I, we're about done. I just wanted to give you some samples. We always brand our programs and give it a name where it's got a kind of a standalone identity from, the, uh, from just something the district is doing, so it's something special. Uh, down in the lower right-hand corner is the logo from, uh, from Glen Allen. Uh, the second one down on the left is the one from Lyle. If you didn't see the book, they had this really cool giveaway for the facilitating team. Uh, the middle one on the right, Project Leaf, is uh, Geneseo. That's where we met Scott Couple that I mentioned earlier. Uh, in terms of helping when Scott retired, he, he asked if he could join us on some projects. The very first one was Neighborville. Uh, lots of materials. Uh, the one on the left is work that we did in Benjamin for their, uh, that was the engagement program that, that led into a successful ballot proposal for them. Uh, the one on the right was from uh, Richland Community Unit School District Number 1 in Olney, Illinois. I went to about two dozen meetings there. They kept telling me I would see a white squirrel. I never did. I don't think they exist. Uh, uh, these are just more samples. The Forward uh, 67 program is golf. I mentioned Jenna's at that meeting today, uh, tonight. The Take the Tour, I wanted to bring that up because when a school district is needing facility improvements, we really like challenging people to go through the buildings and see some of the challenges that the district's facing. A lot of people don't, but if you kind of dare them, don't dare vote until you come look at our buildings, that carries an important message. And whether or not they actually walk through the building or not, you've delivered a message that needs to be delivered. 
Uh, these are just some more examples. Uh, the one up in the upper left is, uh, uh, what's that, a postcard from Huntley? Yeah, that was a postcard. That was a postcard, postcard that we sent out for the first meeting. Uh, Sage Voices was Monticello. Uh, there's a piece from uh, uh, the uh, Indian Prairie where we did uh, some strategic planning work. And I, our new project in Karma, Illinois, Building Pride for Future Bulldogs. They picked that name and uh, we developed a logo for it. Uh, they're, they're having a series of meetings beginning in about two or three weeks, I guess. Uh, and, and digital communications, I'll kind of skip by that, uh, but, but, but Jennifer and, and Jenna are extremely good at kind of high-tech communications that are so important now. If you can marry high-tech and high-touch, you got a heck of a communications uh, program going. That's why we're doing a lot of door-to-door -door work to invite people to meetings. If you're doing high-tech, high-touch, you know, some kind of blitz, you're really, you're really rocking in terms of communications. Let it end with a couple of testimonials. Uh, when you're in our business, a consulting business, I think something that we all agree on is the hardest towns to work in in the United States are college towns. Uh, this is from Iowa City. There's a lot of overly educated people with a lot of time on their hands. Uh, <laughs> We, uh, we work in Iowa City putting together a, a, a master plan for facility improvements. This is one letter that was sent to the uh, newspaper. I wanted, I pulled some, uh, some bullet points out of the letter. It was a, 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 a long letter, uh, but in the very middle you talk about uh, who this person was sitting next to. We randomly assign people to tables so they have to get to know people that they don't know and that's why there was a really nice mix there. And then down at the bottom, I really like this, believe I could sense the overriding interest in arriving at a thoughtful consensus. This was a second letter that uh, was in the paper in Iowa City, uh, you know, a productive exercise in citizen participation down at the bottom. I felt like we were all actually working with each other, uh, left the hall with a deeper and better understanding of people from across town. They learned stuff at the meeting, People should never come to a meeting that they don't learn something. Uh, and then uh, these were, uh, uh, we just had our first community engagement meeting in Huntley. And uh, on the right, if you can read that, was some posts that were made on their Facebook page about, about how people enjoyed the meeting. Proud to be part of that wonderful, uh, proud to be part of that wonderful ideas were shared. I won't read all those to you, but we got some really nice messages uh, on the on the that was on Facebook. Yep. Yeah, on Facebook. Yeah, from, that was from the Huntley. morning after. They had about uh, two hundred people at their yeah. first. P session. Point I want to make is that when people come to these meetings, not only do they feel like they're doing something productive, but but they have fun, and a lot of people in education forget about that piece of it. People will come back if they have a good time. If they're bored, if the meeting goes too long, if the presentation is hard to understand. Uh, Whatever can go wrong will keep people away, and we're very meticulous about making sure the, pe the meeting goes well. Uh, I'll end with a story, but one night in Decatur, Illinois, a long time ago, it taught us a lot. We shortcut the work activity piece of the meeting, and we presented a lot of information. And, it, and this was when we were a little bit more upfront in the process of what we are. At, these meetings were pretty much back in the back and don't say anything. And a community member came up to me after the meeting and literally started thumping me in the chest and saying, we come here to work, we don't come here to hear people like you talk. And that's the part of the meeting they like, and so we make sure there's plenty of time for that collaborative work activity on questions, much like that geometry class I talked to you about, that, that, that's part of the process. Uh, I don't know whether you're thinking about the ballot or not, but I wanted to kind of end talking a little bit about some election stuff. We, we are at the five billion mark and counting on, on referenda for facilities. Uh, and over the years, we'll get from a Board of Education the question, should we go on the ballot? And uh, I say, can you answer every one of these questions? Yes. Do we have a fighting chance? You kind of determine that through public opinion research. Do we have a bulletproof plan? What makes a plan bulletproof is not just what the plan is, but more importantly, how it was put together. Do we have community involvement in putting the plan together? 
Do we have internal unity? Critical important. First election I ever lost for a school district in the 80s, school teachers went on strike a month before the election and said the district's got enough money to pay us whether the referendum passes or not. Well, people figured that out real fast. And then do we have the capacity to conduct an outstanding campaign? And way, way, way when we first started talking, Jennifer used the word integrated. One of the balls that we keep our eye on is using the engagement program to create the capacity to conduct an outstanding campaign. So that's kind of a leave behind. That brings me to talking about the outcome of our community engagement programs, internal and external unity, uh, board staff and community, bulletproof plan, committed volunteers, that capacity that I'm talking about, and then public permission for meaningful change that you've created the foundation for getting the kind of permission, meaning a yes vote, that you need for meaningful change for the school district. Uh, the role we play, uh, community engagement is not a straight line from A to B. It's jagged, it's messy. And uh, uh, we have over the years had various cartoons for herding cats. This is our latest one, <laughs> but it's a little like herding cats and getting everybody kind of on the same page. And we help with that and we help at least go from A to B, even though the path may be a little zigzaggy looking. Uh, then I think the other thing that we've really gotten good at is, is, is just listening and working with our clients and understanding that none of us is as smart as all of us and working collaboratively with your communication staff. For example, if you have a director of communications in a lot of districts, for example, Huntley, that has a communications director, we are working for him sometimes as much as leading the charge because we have increased his capacity quite a little bit. And the same thing about teaming with board members and administrators here and putting a program together that's kind of right for this district, you know, not one that we pulled off the shelf in Lyle or in Glen Allen or, or, or Bedford, New York and, and, and brought here. And so, I, you know, I think one of our real strengths is collaboration and listening and, and making sure that, that all of us are kind of putting together a program that works. Do you have anything else to say? No. So I hope we didn't take too long, but that's, no, I uh, wonder you. if you have you. questions for us. Um, I'm giving us a lens into how do you get a voter's pulse? So ultimately, if we do choose to go to a ballot, what signal, how do you get your signal for whether we have, that voters have an appetite? Well, that, that, that's a complicated question, and, and, and that's, that's about step 90 out of 100 steps, you, you know, in terms of the process. Uh, but, but the answer to that question is, you know, my background, I mentioned I have a PhD in political science, and, and, and one of the tools you use from that is scientific public opinion research. Uh, that is such a rapidly moving target right now uh, in, in terms of what methodology is, 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 is best to choose, uh, that, that, that you've got to stay on top of that. Uh, you know, by far some kind of public opinion survey by telephone is still the ideal solution. Uh, but we have gone in a few short years from having difficulty getting cell phone numbers that are attached to residential addresses to having way too many cell phone numbers that are attached to residential addresses, four or five a house. And because of what the credit card companies have done with your cell phone numbers, the spam calls on your cell phones have just exploded over the last year or two. So, so we are one, still doing a lot of telephone research and, and using technologies to kind of keep the response rate at an acceptable level. Uh, we are doing a lot of electronic surveys, uh, weighting data to make sure the demographics of the electronic survey match the entire community. In 211, for example, we did both. And that's a huge district, so the telephone survey was pretty easy. Uh, when we weighted the results from the electronic survey, they were almost identical with the telephone survey, which gave us two 
independent sources. The, the thing that is coming down the pike in our business are what's called internet panels, the big sampling. I'm, I'm telling you way too much on this. I'm sorry, it's what I know. Uh, that they, they are developing internet panels where they are randomly recruiting people who are paid to respond to electronic surveys so you get a random sample. Those panels haven't been developed extensively enough where you can use it in a geographic area as small as this district. If you wanted to use it for one of the collar counties for a, 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 a county-wide survey, the, the sample is very robust. Uh, you could even probably use one in 211 because it covers such a huge geographic area and a large population. But that's not a technology that's available for this district yet, although probably four or five years from now it will be because people in my business are looking for ways to get scientific surveys done. That, that got way in the weeds, but it, it's, it's interesting how the technology is changing so fast. By the way, I mentioned the credit card companies. What they did was they talked us all into giving, us, giving them our cell phone numbers for early fraud warnings, then they sold all those numbers to marketing companies. That's why you're getting all your spam calls right now. And one thing Rod didn't mm -hmm. tie into is just the voter data analysis. Oh, so also yeah. looking at frequencies, who's voting, when they're voting, those types of things. So if a district or an organization is looking at different dates, there can be some guidance provided by just looking at history in the area as far as turnout numbers, who's voting. Right. Those types and, of and that's something I want to be really clear. You can't do in this room and you can't do as a school. That's got to be what Jennifer was talking about needs to be done by a separately formed campaign committee. And one of the things we're going to be very careful about is, is not, because this is an area where there's a lot of watchdogs, uh, kind of keeping you out of trouble on that. Be, because if you get into the gray area, somebody's going to complain. They're going to complain even if you don't get in the gray area. But, but for example, as volunteers, because they've been a good client, we helped Lyle uh, with that, that election where people were trying to get their tax rate rolled back. Uh, we figured the last thing they needed to do was hire a PR firm to help with the campaign. But all the work that you're talking about, we did with the legally formed campaign committee. And we looked at the voter registration list. We got the, the, all the data we could get from the voter registration information, but we also got a hold of the uh, canvassing app that the Democratic Party uses and, and, and married that onto the voter registration list. So we put together a multi-tiered strategy for both direct mail and door knocking and communications for that district that helped drive social media, canvassing, and mail. But, but again, I want to emphasize, I'm just telling you that for information, that stuff the school district can't get involved in. Now, having said that, as a board member, if you want to, on your own time, be part of that campaign committee, that's, that's perfectly legal. What you can't do is do anything collectively as a board to support the referendum effort. Uh, there is, for example, a library district not very far from here that lost a legal proceeding with the Illinois State Board of Elections because when their pollster reported at a board meeting, polling results profile their results by frequent and non-frequent voters. And the State Board of Education ruled that was electioneering, that it was the board of the library district engaging in electioneering, and they got in trouble for it. So it gets a little nutty sometimes, and it's important to be careful. And we try to stay, we try to stay on top of that the best we can. Uh, you know, we do a lot of work downstate with Stiefel Financial, a bond underwriting firm, and it's really important for them to stay out of trouble, uh, you know, because they're subject to a lot of federal regulations as well as whatever the campaign finance laws are. So we try, try to stay up on that as much as we can. Again, I'm sorry, I'm, ask a question, I can talk for an hour. And I think just to kind of wrap up, uh, we're, what, what brought us here was sort of an organic process. We came out of a strategic plan, and that strategic plan was a, a process that we went through that, that kind of gave us three areas to focus on. And, and so 
what brings us here today is um, the facilities master planning process, uh, which ties along with trying to accomplish our other goals as well. But I mean, I mean that's the piece that we're at now. And, and when we came out of that, we heard a lot from the community, a lot of fantastic ideas. But everybody has fantastic ideas and think they're great, and then they see how much that costs and then they don't necessarily think they're as fantastic as they once were. So um, where we're at now is, is trying to understand and, and work with our community and figure out, all right, now that we put some numbers together, how do we still feel about these? Where are our priorities? What should we be working on as a district? Is this something that's important enough to the district, that, to the community at large, that we think it's going to be an impact, that we should, that we should potentially go out and try to, to, to secure some uh, funds from the community? Um, so this first phase for us and really making sure that we understand um, where those priorities lie and helping us decide what our next steps are going to be is really, right. really important. Um, things like 6-8 middle schools came out of that. That is a complicated conversation to have, right. um, but something that we really need to get a f our finger on the pulse of. So uh, that engagement piece and, and finding the right groups and the right kind of community leaders is going to be really, really important. Um, can you just talk real quickly to some of the success you found in maybe pulling on, um, on really helping refine what that step should be? And, and we need to have very frank conversations and saying, there is no support here. There is nothing. We need to look a different way. We need to, you guys are on the wrong, now that we see Dallas, we're on the wrong track, or we need to look at something like this, that or the other thing. So, um, that first phase, I think, is going to be incredibly important to what we do. Right. A couple of thoughts popped into my head in terms of work that we've done in the past. First thought was, you know, a lot of communities, either, either because they don't have enough debt capacity and they don't want to ask the state legislature for permission to exceed their debt capacity, or because they just don't want to hit taxpayers that hard, think about phasing strategies. Uh, you know, what do we do now? What can we do five, six, ten years from now? When can we come back? How long does it take? 10, 20 years to complete the master plan. And, and, and my experience has been is that, that communities sometimes like to know that you're taking it a step at a time and that you're not trying to do it all at once. Now that varies by community. Uh, you, you, you know, we worked in East Prairie, for example, and, and you know, uh, one building, K-8, passed a $48 million bond proposal uh, that, that exceeded their debt ceiling fourfold and broke the state record on how much they broke their state, their debt ceiling by. And they're soon to move into this really spectacular building. It, it gets back to the polling question, what, what are we able to do? But that phasing piece is important. And then the other thing that sometimes gets hard with phasing is we, we work for Hazelwood School District and they did $280 million dollars over a, oh, maybe 12 year period with three bond elections. And what people identified as the highest priorities conflicted with, with the cheapest way to make all the improvements, if that made sense. For example, I've never been in a community where people place a high priority on middle schools. I don't know why, I think they hate kids that are that age. Uh, but. But Hazelwood needed to make improvements to their elementary schools. The cheapest way to make improvements to the elementary schools was to get the sixth grade out of the buildings to free up space and to have six, eight middle schools just popped into my head when you said that. So the first step in the phasing had to be, one of the steps had to be four brand new middle schools. Well, the hard thing about that was that the polling showed that was not the high priority item. That was not that was not the hot button for the community, but there was no other choice. I mean, if you didn't if you didn't go that route first, everything got a lot more expensive. So that took a lot of communications work and outreach to the community. So they they kind of got it was an entire plan that had to be phased in, not just based on priorities that they assigned the projects, but How's the cheapest way to proceed? And then after the district, they passed the first bond proposal, they built their brand new middle schools, then they were able to implement the rest of it. I think they did 80, 80, and then 120 or something like that. Does that add up to? Sounds right. Yeah. But, but they also were working with their bond underwriting people to figure out 
what those strategies were, you know, what kinds of retirement of debt strategies existed where they could do a, a phased in approach to taking care of the facilities. So, so at some time, you got to get the whole team put together so you can figure out what those viable options are, I guess. Uh, not only your architects, but who, who's doing your public finance piece of it. Again, a long-winded answer. No, I, no I, we have, look, we got to make some hard I decisions. I love this stuff. So I, I, <laughs> no, it, it's important for us to understand your process. And, and um, I guess then one quick last thing to end on would be, uh, um, can you tell me a little bit about the makeup of your team and, and, and what that would look like? As well, well, you're looking at two people that would be taking the leadership in that we wanted to bring Jenna Engler here because she, she'll be helping us. Jenna has worked on all of our research. She put this book together. She has put, put, worked on all of our recent community engagement programs in the, in the Chicago area. She's absolutely terrific. Uh, you won't get too confused by Jennifer and Jenna. Uh, also on our staff, we have uh, Cindy Gibson, who's going to help in a backup support role. Cindy was a, uh, 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 well, when she retired, she was an associate superintendent for communications and a bunch of other stuff at Rittner School District, pretty large school district. She had been our client for 25 years, and when she retired, she knew our agency better than we knew it ourselves, and she retired into working for our agency, and Cindy is... What she has brought to the table for us, although Jennifer worked for a school district too, uh, but, but Cindy really brings in understanding kind of how the education community thinks about issues because she had to do that in a leadership role for so many years. So she's invaluable to us to kind of thinking about it from kind of the other side of the table, if you will. Uh, so, so she'll be in a kind of a backup role too, but who you'll see most is Jennifer and Jenna and, and, and myself although you'll get where you don't want to see me, so. And then we also have copywriters and graphic artists. We have right. video teams that we work with on a regular basis. So any of that creative support as well, we have access to if we need it, so. Right, yeah, we didn't talk about that much, but we've got some, we got some great people that do, do all that work that you saw yeah, you, was you showed us a lot of samples, so we yeah. appreciate that. Right. And, and a lot of, even for example, 211, they have a, they have a big communication staff. But, but it's not like these people are sitting around twiddling their thumbs all day long, and when they take on something like this, they, they may need some outside capacity, so we hope on that. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. Any well, other comments or questions? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time. Well, thank thanks you for so inviting much. us. Thank you appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, uh, I'm, I'm going to steal back my book. I don't know where the other one is. There. Oh, there it is. We don't have very many of those left. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you. We ought to give one to you. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry we ran late. Yeah, thanks for listening. Thank you around. so much for waiting. Okay. That, school, that school's pretty cool, and it's a very nice school. Yeah, I got the private tour of that. It was very cool. Yeah, yeah. isn't that nice? Yeah. Yeah, the library alone. Uh huh. Good night. Thank you. Right. Good night. Thank, Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you. So next up on the agenda is actually to, to go ahead and review and discuss uh, the presentations that we've seen today to help us select the next step here. Anyone have any thoughts on the presenters this evening? And just to be clear, um, it's not an action item. It, it's just discussion at this point. The action item would be brought forth uh, at the next meeting. I suppose I feel like personally um, my maybe reservations after learning the news about Paul I thought that was flushed out and he was very straightforward about it and I like how deep his bench is and all the different disciplines that he that he has on his team and the fact that 
ultimately it's about trust in the taxpayer. Like that whole messaging that he had, I thought was pretty powerful um, because it is about the, the taxpayer and the community and getting them behind it and what they can stomach. So I, I thought that he did a good job of fleshing that out. Into the rush. Come on. I think we'd be fine either way. Just kind of the conclusion that I had before we had this discussion. Um, I think both have shown, you know, great results or success in, in their projects, and but I, I, I'm still stuck on, you know, we got the business card, you know, consulting group of White and Company. And, you know, we, we talk about, you know, his answer, well, I don't know who the project manager is, but, you know, you, you just talked to the senior vice president, who's our liaison. So I actually kind of thought that was actually detrimental to <laughs> the argument. So that's, I, I think, if we kind of just look at you know what the the end deliverables would be. I think we'd be fine in, in either case. I tend to agree. I landed in the same spot coming in and wasn't swayed either way by either presentation, feeling like one was stronger than the other. Both of them have seem to have their strengths. Um, uh, and so I and I don't want to go into which what the strengths were of each, but um, I landed in a similar spot that Steve did. and we were worried about a conflict of interest um, with uh, Beyond Your Base being a subsidiary of White & Company. Um, I think absent that conversation, all the dialogue prior to that evening was our confidence in the work of Paul Hanley and his record of success in our community with the same voters that we're going to be turning to this time around different district. Um, I think the, um, how do I phrase this? I'm not, I'm not so concerned about the conflict of interest at present that I'd be willing to um, roll the dice, I guess, on art. I mean, I'm not saying it's a roll of the dice. I'm not really sure I'm, I'm phrasing this. I would say that that's, I think, what we've talked about with Paul being the guy, based on our success, his success in our community, the administration's recommendation, I think all that is worth it, even considering the, the appearance of a conflict, the you know, appearance of a conflict of interest. And I think it would, it would be, um, I don't think it'd be a good idea to turn our back on that. I think um, we, 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 we fleshed it out as a board, we discussed it, we heard from Paul. Um, if the community, like, I can't remember which board member asked the question. Um, maybe it was you, Emily, maybe, or maybe it was Steve. But um, we, we, we were public about our, our concerns about a potential conflict of interest. We were, we were above the board. We did that in the light of day. We, we vetted it, the seven of us, and we recognized that it was, um, it was a good decision. I'm not saying that we have recognized it yet, but I would say I feel comfortable saying it was a good decision going with him. With eyes wide open, we, we did our homework, think about what was good for our community, and we went with somebody who we thought we were going to get the best results from. So if the board was feeling confident about going with Paul, I would support the decision. Jill agrees. <laughs> Emily, thoughts? Um, I'm torn. I, if you take the white and company piece out of the equation, I would say go with Paul. Um, but I don't know. I was not necessarily convinced um, that he has a good like response to people who are going to come at him and say, you work for the architect, don't you think that is a problem? You know, and I think people are going to say that. Like, I think step forward. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just think 
you're going to get a lot of people who are going to know that, find that out, bring that straight to the attention of everyone they can. They can. And I think he, he made an interesting comment, I thought, today when he mentioned that White came to him and said, yeah, we want that, what, yeah. why would White? He did say that. Why would White do that? Why is White doing that? Like, to me, that makes me think, hmm, interesting. Why would White want to have a consultant on their team whose intention is to pass referendums where they build schools? To me, that just, like, that looks a little, hmm, interesting. I don't know. Like I said, I'm, I'm kind of a cynic in this department, so. There's a couple of signals there. One is, yeah, that they chose to, like, make a strategic play to bring that type of group into their organization. Yes. That's a business decision for them, and that's their choice. The choice to make a phone call to him prior to coming here tonight just sends red flags to me of they have they see the conflict of interest and have no issue with stepping beyond those lines. Um, and so that's more of, more of a reflection of White and Company than I think it is of Beyond the Bay, Andrew Base. I agree. Um, but but either way, it's still the same organization. Into, it still could play into our overall, um, like. I I hear you and. Um, yeah, I hear you guys too. Certainly, I, I, I certainly think that's a challenge. Um, and I think just as much as it is a challenge for him having an answer, I think it's about us having an answer to that because really it's about us being able to hold him to account. Um, certainly White and company wants the business, but obviously they have a long-term relationship with us as well. And I think that that's important. I don't. I don't know that he necessarily has a good, a great narrative on why it's not a conflict of interest, but I guess I solidly don't believe that it is. And where I came in today, I really wanted, I think, to be able to go another, the other route because I felt like it was going to be a safer place to be. Um, but when Unicom ARC uh, came in, I feel like I would be excited about them if we were going out to strategic planning right now feel like they have good vision for that. Um, I feel like Hanley and his team and Beyond Your Base had a better vision of taking us through the second phase of really understanding we went out to strategic plan and we've got to take it to that next step in understanding if what we have works for our community and really deep diving and, and building core relationships inside the community. I guess I was a little bit nervous about the process that we would take um, with Unicom ARC, that we would get the results that we want for this particular project at this particular time. And for that reason, I'm more inclined to, to move to Beyond Your Base, but I would encourage this board, if we do, to, to find out how we make sure that we with them build a firewall between White and Company and the work that they do and, and the work that the Under Base would do. Um, I feel like I could be comfortable doing that. I feel like that would be a better fit for our district at this time. Um, but I think that would have to be something that would be considered by the rest of the team. I just I looked at the presentation they did today and both of them and both of them were liked but for different reasons. And I'm just looking at where we, we are strategically at this point and I feel like um, and granted, he had a little bit of an advantage because he's worked in this community, but his homework that was done in, in understanding kind of the steps and the processes that he wanted to take, I felt were more clear. For we were in, I felt like I was getting guidance on, on the steps that we needed to take to really understand our community and where we needed to go. Um, and I feel like there would be a lot of ramp up time on the other side. Uh, I thought he addressed the also with having Marsha and other gentleman's name I forgot here to talk about that a lot of this is outsourced to their their Jim their polls and other stuff it's not just his team it's the other because those are outside outfits but part of his toolkit. excellent point yeah that, that I think that was one of those so they're gonna go out and pull and do stuff but it's not white it's not beyond your base doing it it's the guy yeah, but who pays them we do. We pay them, but, but we're paying them through paying 
be on your face, correct? Or do we, it's, uh, I'm just asking, I don't know. You know what I mean? I, don't I believe know. yes. I believe we pay one, four it's installments of entities. total dollars. But actually, I'm not sure now, but I remember looking at the proposal. <laughs> it is, it's him and, and his team, and then he puts his team together. This is a team that he's worked with for a significant amount of time. So, I, you know. Well, here's, here's a way that I'm, I'm thinking about it. Is Beyond Your Base going to push us to beyond the draft plan that's been established? Are they going to push us to you know, potential plan B or C or other as ARC would? I think ARC would kind of push us to kind of find alternative solutions, whereas Beyond Our Base would kind of go in with closer to that 244 or 250. I get the exact opposite. I think the exact opposite. They were the only proposal out of the four that came in that said, maybe we don't even talk about any of these these plans. And you, you know, kind of like when Craig, Craig stood up at a meeting right. one time and said, what do we tear down all the schools and start over or whatever, tear down the two middle schools, like big mind blowing ideas, <laughs> like outside the box. Yeah, no, and, and I, I believe you know, he, he definitely articulated that extremely well. I was trying to think of in terms of financial incentives for whites. See, he on the other hand, I, I felt like said to us, um, that's not possible. Like, I, I feel like he was the one that said, you're gonna have, you're gonna have to figure out something else. That's not gonna be a possibility here. And, um, and I think he also talked about working in communities where he, they said, all right, they started at 90, they went down to 62 or whatever, and then they got down to, it's about building that. I think he has a goal of working back in this community again. Um, so I'm not really necessarily work, like, I The one thing I felt confident in that he wasn't going to try to bulldoze his way through getting something done, because that's not something that I think any of us on this board um, want either, because I don't think that any of us want to live in this community where something is bulldozed through. I don't think any of us would be happy with that. So, I don't so. think any of us think that. I don't, and I, I think I, like, personally, I don't think that he would try to do something just to, like, make White and Company a bunch of money and try to say that he doesn't want to make that happen. But I'm looking at it more from the perspective of, like, outside people, people who are going to be trying to right. undermine what we are going to try to accomplish with this, and they're going to use that as a way to do it. They're going to use right. this perception of, this, like they're going to blow this up into maybe something that it is not, but they still do it, you know. Like they still have lots of other reasons to to blow it up. And but should, and so should we give them it. another one? I don't know. I mean, I'm just, you know, right off. It always there until it get until it gets to that point where there's an actual plan. Is that what I'm like it's it won't it. What if it doesn't look like what we started off thinking it was going to be? Like the whole point is what he's talking about is like keeping true to the taxpayer and what they want what they want. That was like a thing he hammered over and over again. Both of them kinda did. But sure. Like, but well there will be some people who will want nothing. They'll say we will not pay one more dime in taxes no matter what I don't care, I'm not paying a dollar. I've already so, heard them. <laughs> we heard about heard Exactly. Them from but that's what I'm saying. So if we like you know they're gonna be there. Yep. What if this helps to amplify that voice and get more people on that bandway? I I don't know. I mean I'm just Kind of playing devil's advocate and bringing it out there. I don't know. I mean, I don't personally think that's the case. I don't, but I just I can see that happening. Like, do we give another reason for people to vote no when maybe they wouldn't otherwise? I don't know. Um, and I and I hear you, and it's it's why we're having this meeting here today because I think we were all ready to go, you know, yes. and then and then this right. happened, right? And so, uh, well, okay. and I appreciate that. I think where I'm at is. I guess I'm not trying to get to a vote of yes. I'm trying to actually get what is really wanted and needed by the community. And then most likely that's going to turn into us having to ask for something, right? But, right. I, but ultimately, when I was looking at the, I, I felt a, that he had a little bit stronger approach and his team had a little bit stronger approach to getting us that answer. No matter what that answer ended up looking like, I felt like he had a, a full arc picture for it where the other team I felt like was coming in like we were doing a strategic plan. Let's be open-minded, let's get every new voice in, let's, and all fantastic things. Like I think they would be a wonderful team to work with. I just um, think they would have been fantastic on the, the other phase of the project. And maybe that's just because he had the advantage of working in this community and he was able to kind of present the full 
spectrum a little bit better, but that's what, that's what engaged me on that part. I feel like we do the first half of this correctly, but that, that becomes a moot point because we're not just steamrolling and going, oh, mm -hmm. the effort is to get every dollar to, to white number. If we actually go through this first phase correctly, then that, that, that's not an argument. If, we go, if they come back and they go, yeah, you should just try to get $200 million out of people, yeah. I think, I think we point. definitely have that, that problem. But um, I'm staying open-minded, but I, that's, that's where my, I, I'm, I'm weighted over. Say after this meeting. I was just thinking in my head, like, aren't we basically, are we essentially hiring, potentially, Paul to do exactly the opposite of what White and Company would want him to do if there was indeed some kind of something insidious going on between White and Beyond Your Face? We, we, have, we have a, um, a vision that costs $250 million. He's already told us that's, that's ludicrous. But, that, that would, but his job is to help us pare that down to the Potentially the ridiculous. He said that's ridiculous. Okay, well, sorry. Well, he just dropped words. <laughs> <laughs> I, I concur it was ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. But his his his, uh, his his objective, his stated objective, and what we're, we're 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 contracting with him to do is to help us find the the dollar amount that's going to be most palatable to our community. So if I mean we're we're help, he's helping us be fiscally responsible. If anybody was going to make hay about the fact that he's trying to deliver the to his employers, I don't think there's any. There wouldn't be any evidence to support that. I mean, everything he's going to come to us is going to be, "Hey, I've spoken to your community about this. I believe you have 65 percent of the community who's going to support this. If it, if you went with this package, you're only going to have." 48 or 50.4 percent support or whatever. I mean, I mean, I just, I'm not. I mean, I, I definitely hearing what you're saying, Emily, and I, you know, I'm concerned about perception and, and, and appearances. But I don't know if, if you know, if the what we're asking you to do, what he's actually going to be doing, is going to, is going to lend any like credence to that. The part that lends credence to it is when you lead in your first task force group with a six-eight middle school proposal. Um, that's not his idea. That was it's our idea. idea. I mean, that's an that's an idea. It's not our idea. It's not the idea. It's an idea. And I think the pushback that Craig gives us, I think, is perfectly perfectly on point. That what we're looking for is the best answer for the community versus seeding the community with an answer, and then getting them to react to a binary yes or no. It. Uh, it lends credence to the challenge of not being creative in our plan A and plan B, but first, instead of saying plan A is 180 and plan B is $75 million, uh, based on the facilities master plan that we have today, uh, that uh, I don't think it's lending credence to we're asking them to go against what white company was tasked with. I think what they want, to, they want to have passed the largest possible thing that we can get passed. Um, and I, I think, honestly, like my fear right now is we end up going to the community and we get shot back that nothing is passable. Because we haven't done the, the right level of diligence around coming up with creative proposals that really are palatable for the community. Um, and I don't see, uh, I think the strategic plan process that playbook of having the community own what the proposals are and that cash dollar amounts to it actually lends a lot more credence to the community owning that playbook and ultimately voting a yes, rather than us giving them plan A and plan B to give them a binary yes or no on either of it. But that's, I, I think, exactly what he proposed. He's starting with that because it, we, our strategic plan well, said you start that with that? important. But that's what it said is important. We need to know if we want to take that off the list or not. I think that, and I don't think it has to be a binary question. I think. I think we have to go in and say, um, if that's a critical component to what we're doing, then that, that looks different than if we take that out of the mix. And I think that, that because that's a unique piece to what came out of our strategic plan, that wasn't, that wasn't district push, that was community pushed, we can't 
I don't want to pretend like that part didn't happen because that was community built. And I think we go back to the community and say, all right, this is where you were before. Are we there? Do, should we look at something different? And I think all options need to be on the table. I think that's a dialogue. And that's what I, I think what he talked about was building, building teams and stakeholders so that they create versus uh, we create. I, I think both teams said that. I think there's a, I don't think we've walked in, I don't want to recreate the work that we did though. I don't think we start with a blank slate. I think we start with where we left off. Just from me not being there, and I think listening has given me a little bit of a, I don't think any of us are 100% on either one. Um, so I don't know if we want to think about it and discuss more on the 16th or what we want to do. But from listening in and hearing everyone, no one is 100%. And so I'm not sure what don't I don't feel like we need to be making a decision like off of none of us being 100%. I mean, on one part, I feel like we're just rationalizing why it would be easier to go with Paul um, because of the background. But then, you know, if we want this to go 100%, then maybe it's better we go with someone who has, there's no gray areas. Um, but again, uh, I don't think any of us are, you know, very clear on, or a hundred percent clear. I do worry though that putting the boat off longer is not. Like, that is not. I, I feel like we need to. I think he's saying we marinate we need in to, it today. I don't know if and go over the next two weeks or the next week we uh, we talk amongst ourselves and figure this out. Well, we do. We have, uh, we have a workshop later this month. Before then. Why can't we vote on the sixteenth? We can. Well, she's, she's saying we're still discussing on the oh. 16th. I don't know. Are we allowed to discuss and vote in the same meeting? We can. Yeah. yeah. No, you, you yeah. could definitely have discussion and then an action item. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, just, I started this conversation in the same spot Steve did, and I'm not sure if you're still there, but I think we can't go wrong either way. There are pros and cons to both of these organizations. Yeah. Right. Uh, and so uh, I don't know which way I'd vote right now on who would I vote for. Ultimately, I think I do need to marinate on that a bit. Um, probably talk to, uh, uh, actually, like more so, like go go through their proposals a bit, um, right? More than anything else. Uh, but I'm ready to do a 16th vote if that's what we decide on. I think that's the direction we should go. Right. If I had my. Two well, can we just? Is, any, is anybody prepared to make a definitive judgment? I mean, can we take an official straw poll to see where we're? Well, where well we since are? we got everybody, I guess one um, perspective that I actually be really interested with Kevin's, Todd's, and, and Megan's. I, I think this is, this touches you very closely, so is there any? Well, the, the, the first comment I would make to all board members is you're at about the four hour mark for tonight. And, um, yeah. you know, <laughs> I, I think you're wise not to rush into a decision. I think Jill's suggestion of letting it marinate a little bit and then rereading proposals is a very good one. Um, I thought you saw two um, similar but different proposals tonight. Um, both, I think we could be very successful. Why would I say that? Because I know all of our neighboring school districts that have worked with both of these people and have been very successful. It's very hard to argue against Paul Hanley in District 99, and I think because he was successful in 99, you might have some of those ethical considerations um, mitigated because this town knows Paul and he's worked with District 99. I also think with Unicom ARC, um, you've got successful track records on uh, just about every district that touches District 58, Lyle 202, uh, District 203 in Naperville, Wheaton 200, I mean, you, you, you saw the list, Glen Ellen 89. But I think you have two very different points of emphasis on both parties here. Um, I think with Unicom, you're looking at really taking that draft master facility plan in putting that thing through the ringer and really emphasizing the community engagement piece around that. And so I think with, with Paul, you're really starting with that draft master facility plan 
in really putting the emphasis behind the scientific approach toward the, the second part, not that they don't emphasize the community engagement piece, but I think their strength lies in getting that ball across the goal line, if that makes sense, where I think Unicom's really is more at the front end, um, but both I think can do very well. I think with, with Paul's presentation tonight, I would like to hear more about what community engagement looks like. I think we know that a little bit though because of his work with 99, and I think on the flip side with ARC, hearing what that scientific process looks like besides just at step 99 out of 100, and, and we've got people who do that, I would have liked to have heard a little bit more. Um, as the superintendent, um, in, in Todd and I have had many conversations from a business perspective. Megan and I haven't had as many detailed uh, conversations, but we can certainly have that and report back next week. I'm comfortable with, with either group. I think no matter what, it, it, it's gonna be a lot of work from the board and the administrative team putting this together. Uh, but we do need outside help, um, but from an administrative perspective, I know both models are successful. I've seen both models be successful, and I think I can work with either one. It's where are you at as members of the Board of Education, because this is one thing that I think we all need to rally behind and all be on the same page in order for it to be successful. Um, I, I do think you've got a lot of information tonight to kind of reflect on. Um, what I would ask the Board to do is really reflect on that community engagement piece, that qualitative piece that everyone's talking about, and then that quantitative piece, that scientific piece, at the, the second piece. And, and which company do you think would better serve us to get through that? Um, I do applaud the board's transparency, though, with, with all of this. Whenever you have questions like this, um, I think you're doing the exact right thing. You're putting it all out there. You're discussing it. And I do think when people come back, if they do come back and you do choose Paul's firm over Unicom, you do have a pretty strong argument to say, wait a second, we've, we've discussed this, we've been uh, very transparent uh, about that process. Uh, that being said, you may choose not to go down that road because it's just not worth it in your eyes, um, but um, I, I do think you have a strong leg to stand on. So I don't know if that directly answered your question, Steve, but I, I think as an administrative team, we are um, prepared to, to work with either group and I think we can be successful with either group. Yeah, so um, no direct conflicts um, that we can speak of. I, th I think everybody, though, is, is cautious about a perception. And so, you know, again, I'm not, I, I know I'm being extremely gray here, but no legal um, conflict of interest to speak of. But um, perception-wise, you are, certainly want to be careful with that. Well, ultimately, I think then feel free to reach out to me or, or Dr. Russell over the next few days if, there, if there's feedback we need to get or if we even need to reach back out to any of the parties to get additional information. But we'll make sure that this is on the October 16th agenda um, with both. We have some discussion time with both uh, contracts available to us so that we can make a, a final uh, decision on that day. Uh, hopefully we can come to some consensus on that day. If for some reason we can't, we do have a workshop later on this. Yes, you have a workshop on the, I'm looking at the calendar right now, on October 28th. So if you, you, you still have two more bites at the apple this month. Um, but I think as both people suggested today, my recommendation would be to make a decision on October 16th so we can get the ball rolling uh, with this. Um, that being said, though, I also want to say something that Darren said don't rush into a decision that you can't all get behind because this is very important that you know the community sees all of us walking in the same direction i think that that's very important uh, if the board's able to do that okay well then uh let's get this wrapped up it is 10 o'clock at night so um a reception of visitors we don't have any left so we're going to go ahead and, and move on. we have a couple of announcements. Uh, Tuesday, October 15th at 7 a.m. is the policy committee, at, committee meeting at the ASC, and Wednesday, October 16th at 7 p.m. is a regular board meeting at Village Hall. Uh, with that, is there a motion to adjourn? Just an amendment. We also have a legislative committee meeting this, uh, this Wednesday. Oh, that's right. That's given. So when's that at? This Wednesday at the ASC at 345. October, uh, October 9th October at 345 9th, yeah. at at ASC? Yeah.
at ASC. Uh, actually, let me, uh, we're going to, because the Health and Wellness Committee is going to meet at ASC, so, so we're going to meet the Legislative Committee will meet here at Longfellow. At Longfellow. Right. So Legislative will be here. Um, I will help lead that, and then the Health and Wellness will be at uh, ASC at the same time. Okay. Uh, I'm going to motion to close the meeting. <laughs> okay. Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carried. The meeting is adjourned at 10.07 p.m. Have a good night,